This Ferrari hasn't been on the road in over 11 years. And after I bought it, I found out the exact reason why. And with that reason, it could mean the deal I got on this may not be as good as I first thought. Now, I know you, just like me, enjoy a bargain, especially when it comes to cars. And as petrol heads try and find the best car we can get for as little money as possible, which is quite hard when it comes to a Ferrari. For a decent Ferrari F430, you're looking to pay above £70,000. But there's something special about the one that I bought. It's a manual. And manuals are like unicorns. In fact, I can only see one for sale in the whole of the UK. And it's nearly £100,000. But I managed to get this for way cheaper than that. But there's a catch. <laughs> the lads have come for delivery. Special delivery service. Of a pristine condition Ferrari F430. Oh, wow. I previously bought a Merchelago from a track experience company. And let's face it, I was kind of scammed. What on earth has happened to this car? But recently, I found out they were selling this Ferrari. So why would I go back to a place to buy a car where I was previously scammed? Well, I didn't. Somebody else did. Oh, yeah, so so the window was down, so we had to like, do a bit of oh, no, a, no. Of MacGyver here to hold the window up, so, so everything would have fallen out. Oh my god! It's a real hard up point. No yeah. way! So we were assured, we were assured that everything is complete. There's uh, the whole, everything for the car is here. So it's a complete car, yeah? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Thanks for the work, guys. <laughs> With my relationship with the track experience place being not so great, Freddie, Scott and Sam went down there to check some cars out without me. Um, it's gated and it's got the gate. I don't know where the knob is though. And this time, with Sam doing the negotiating, he got himself a deal. I bought this one. You bought that? I bought that. So technically, Sam bought the car, but then delivered it and sold it straight to me. <laughs> Delivering another quality car. <laughs> so this is a Ferrari 430, which should have a 4.3 V8 here, not here. <laughs> Apparently engine went, uh, went bang, and then there was a transmission that went on another car, so they stole the transmission for another car. Then the transmission got stripped to be rebuilt, and then no one put it back together. So a lemon of a car, like most of the cars I buy really, but I still think at the price we got it at, it was a deal. For once, we've actually got a car that Hannah likes. I do like it. And so that means you can <laughs> oh, have the, the Ferrari. <laughs> quite I approve. Actually. So as you probably know by now, this car, well it does have an engine, it's just in bits. Hey, that's my hat. one of their mechanics could go says please do not <laughs> <laughs> so after they decided not to put this car back together i think due to all the stickers on it sat inside a shopping center a shopping mall if you're american and on display to advertise the track experience oh <laughs> to advertise the track experience company we've got valves and to make it look legit right now the car sits really high at the back because there is no engine or there's not a full engine in the back and there's a piece of wood right at the bottom here. Can you see that? There. And from what I've been told, that wood was put there and there was loads of sandbags put in the back to make it look like it had an engine in, like weighed it down. So when it sat in the shopping mall, it looked like a nice Ferrari which people could come and look at. Now, we've got to save it. But first, we've got to work out what's worth saving. Is any of this stuff that came with the car even possible to put back together? I guess this is an oil cooler. Nice, okay. I found a gearbox. <laughs> Here's part of it. <laughs> there was so much stuff in so many different boxes. My dad seemed to find it hilarious. A lot of this stuff, I don't even know what it's for. And it wasn't long until we found somebody else's tools. We're up. Because there's some moldies holding some air. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is that? <laughs> what, 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 
I think the mole grips which were left there are clamping the hose for the clutch fluid to stop it pouring out anywhere. But hey, I'm not turning down some free mole grips. Make a good table out of that. The registration is MXO5HCD. Let's check this out. The last known mileage in 2011 was 31,065 miles. And that was in 2011. So how many more miles has it done since that mileage record? If it actually has done that low mileage, this car is gonna be worth a lot more than I paid for it once I've finished it. <laughs> we have a light. We got a light? Look at the oil pressure. <gasps> Mileage, mileage, mileage. Uh, yeah, 32,338. Yeah. <laughs> the car has done 1,200 miles after 2011 and then ended up like this. How has that ended up like this? So the guys didn't lie about what mileage this car had done, but how the hell has a Ferrari with this low mileage ended up in this state? I haven't got any doors. Wait, 2,642 seconds. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> it's all locked, it? Uh, that's locked, isn't it? It is locked, yeah. Oh no! Oh my god, there is so much to do on this car. And I guess this is where the realisation of what I've just bought has settled in. I've never owned, driven, or even sat in a Ferrari. And now I've got to rebuild one. There's a few things before we get onto that, what I've, we've figured out on here. So this bumper is all smashed up on the front. And as this car was like a, a display car sat inside a shopping center or a shopping mall, there's no way they sat it inside the shopping mall on display with a broken bumper. So they've definitely, that, there's been another Ferrari on track which they've nicked the bumper off and put this crashed one on there, definitely. And then the same with the rear bumper. Like this rear bumper is not even the right color. There's no way they put that on display. So I reckon they've kind of almost used this as a parts car, which also explains why, I mean, like, oh geez, <laughs> there's no window regulator in here. That's probably been taken out for another car. There's no door handles on the other side. There's not even any wiper linkage on there. So I reckon it's sat there and it's been used as a parts car, which is unfortunate. But there's one thing missing here, which I think tells a story on why this engine is in bits. The actual cylinders, that one, do you think that one's scored? Yeah. Oh yeah, that one is scored. You can yeah. feel it. So all these cylinders are meant to be smooth. This is what the piston goes up and down in. And the rings are meant to create a nice seal as they're going up and this is scored. So it's going to let stuff through it. But I don't think that is why this engine is out. The bottom of the block looks okay, but what you can see is on the bearings, they've got this copper kind of look to them. So they've got really hot and wore away the bearings, which shows that potentially there was no oil getting to them. Pretty much everything that rotates on a car requires a bearing. And the crankshaft is no different. And bearings need oil. Oil is fed to the crankshaft bearings through oil journals. Basically, little holes in the crankshaft. And this creates a microscopic layer of oil between the bearing and the crankshaft to keep it moving. And if the oil flow stops, then bearing wear like this can happen, causing catastrophic engine failure. So one thing that we've noticed, or not noticed, there's no oil pump here. Uh, and the oil pump and the water pump on this car, after looking and doing a bit of research, is one complete thing. If the water pump failed, then the oil pump could have failed, and that could have caused the oil starvation, and that's why the engine could be apart. Maybe, I don't, I don't know. Now you've seen all that we've got with the car, let me tell you the price. From rebuilding Audi TTs in a restaurant car park, I never thought it would lead to this moment where I'm putting Ferrari F430 on the board that I bought for £60,000, which may sound steep for what I've got with it, but there was a savior and a reason on why we pulled the trigger on this. 
Sam told me about this car when we was out in America fixing the GT3 and I knew the exact state it was in. And from my previous experience, I knew it was unlikely that the whole engine was going to be there. Which almost stopped me from buying it. But then I showed the pictures to Freddy and what are the chances? He actually had a spare engine in his okay. workshop. So we, get, we won't get this on the flight back. <laughs> How can I buy this off you? Oh, I'll give it to you if you want. You give it to me? Yeah, yeah, I'll give it to you. <laughs> we could, we could it to Let's do that. Let's do that and we've got an engine. Oh, do, you, do you have a gearbox? I don't. No. <laughs> With Freddy giving us an engine, all we had to do is work out how to get it back to the UK. So we boxed it up. I don't, I don't put any warranties on that engine. I have not opened it up. So, you know, you, buyer, you know, you get what you pay for. You get what you pay for. All done and ready to ship to the UK. So now I'm feeling pretty confident because not only have we got a Ferrari at a half decent price, we've got an engine as well. It's only Ferrari. Yeah, it made it. <laughs> 800 quid. Hey! And here is the F430 engine all the way from Florida to the UK. But there is one catch with this engine. <laughs> Go this way, no, Freddy scammed us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Two broken engines, but at least one's in almost one piece. This seems like the impossible rebuild, but for £60,000 with a free engine from Freddy, this could work out perfectly depending on how bad this engine is damaged. So, one engine which is seized and another engine which is in pieces. If we can find out why this engine is seized, we might have a good chance on building one good engine out of two bad ones. If we manage to rebuild this engine and actually get it running, we should be Italian mechanics. <laughs> Let's find out what exactly is wrong with Freddy's engine. It doesn't turn over and it seems locked out. So we're going to start from the top of the engine and work our way down. First off is the rocker covers. It didn't reveal much there, so now we're taking the cover for the chain off. So this, it's either really clean or brand new. Oh no! Oh, that stinks! There's water in this engine. I don't know how close it got to the P1 at Freddy's, but it, <laughs> it stinks. Could this engine be flooded? But it doesn't make sense. But this all looks new. It looks like it's had new tensioners, new chain, and like, everything looks new. That, like, mm. It's like a smaller version of the Mercer Largo. Oil pump on the bottom here. Then you've got like a balance shaft, then go into the two camshafts at the top, two camshafts at the top. It is literally a, almost like a carbon copy, but a smaller version of the Mercialago engine. I think we could do this, provided we can work out what's actually wrong with this engine. But the good news, all this looks new. Do we trust it? I don't know. Before we went any further, I got the camera down some of the spark plug holes to see if there was anything unusual down there. But it didn't really reveal much. We couldn't see anything obvious, which now left us with no choice but to start stripping apart the engine even further. Now we're going to take the chains off. These are what keep the engine in time, making sure the valves open and close at the right time and they don't get hit by the pistons. Once the chains were loose, we could then remove the camshafts from the top of the engine. This then revealed the head bolts. Big 12mm Allen keys to get the head bolts out. And of course, that was the next step. Go up, lift it off. But everything looked okay. Diesel in it, which my dad put in. Yeah. Sleeves look good. They didn't look like there was any damage there. Yes, the pistons and everything weren't brand new, but nothing looked damaged. And that goes for the other side as well. So, 
Why is it see if it turns over now? <laughs> yeah, let's try and turn it now. Will it turn? No. Solid. Freddy is still scammed us. We're coming for you, Freddy. <laughs> <laughs> So the problem must be on the underside of the engine. So now we've got to strip the oil pump and the water pump off it and investigate further. We've took all of this apart and the crank still won't move. We think a piston is seized in here for some unknown reason. Um, possibly these two here, but it's a bit wet. Like it is wet in here, so I don't know like where the water's got in and it seized it up. The rest of the engine does actually look all right. I mean, these bearings, they're not brand new, but they're not bad. But as I started to take the con rods off the crank, I noticed something unusual. Is that bent? That's bent. Oh yeah. It sucked water up and it's bent, isn't it? Found it. Maybe this was a flooded engine because check it out. This con rod is bent. Look at the banana. You can see how bent it, are, bent it is. It's locked up the engine. The rest are all straight. When a piston is going up and down the cylinder, it's compressing air. But when water finds its way in there, it struggles to compress it. So as the piston rises to the top, it's the case of who's the weakest link. And that's usually the con rod, which would leave it looking bent like this. That's quite good news actually then, because we've got some con rods over there. We've got a bent comrade and now two engines in absolute pieces. Maybe Freddy didn't scam us. <laughs> <laughs> and that is what happens when you try and compress a fluid. Somebody is going to lose and the conrod has lost badly there. Let me explain the bumper situation. In fact, Hannah's going to explain the bumper situation. This is not the bumper that should be on a F430. This is a Scuderia bumper, which is a little bit more expensive. In fact, a lot more expensive than a 430 bumper. How much is one of these bumpers? The bumper alone, £3,245.20. Not only that, this thing here, how much is that? £2,263.72p. <laughs> and 72p? This is like over £5,000 worth of bumper and it's got self-tapper screws in it. It's absolutely battered. Safe to say, I don't think we're going to be replacing it with a Scuderia bumper. We're going to have to look elsewhere. It's salvageable. Now the rear bumper, I don't think it's actually original, but it is a 430 bumper, but how much is one of them? 3,101. And the diffuser, which is missing, which is what we're going to need to buy, is how much? Oh, wait. <laughs> how, how, how much is the... The diffuser is 3,101 pounds. The yeah. bumper is 4,480. The carbon one, 8,430. <laughs> oh my. So we're not having a carbon diffuser. Okay, we've definitely got to find maybe some second-hand parts. I don't know. I'm not sure that's supposed to be in here. Oh, is it off? Well, the bumper's off. Yay! Now, seeing as this car hasn't been on the road in over 11 years, it's gathered a lot of dust. So I thought it's only right that we cleaned it, which made me notice a few strange things. Grey, grey, and then on this side, silver and silver. Nice. And now it's time we remove any evidence of it ever being a track experience car. Although I think its life on track was short lived, as the bodywork's looking pretty good for an X track car. How good has this turned out? It's starting to look promising. For a 2005 car, the paint looks really good, bearing in mind it's been absolutely battered around a track its whole life. We've got a little like i don't know whether it's peel or like i don't know if it's rust because i think these are aluminium so i don't that's just that's a problem apparently on the f430s it's common for the lights to wobble there's no exception on my one because <laughs> <laughs> it's so 
sticky. It leaves fingerprints in it. <laughs> but the time that it did spend on track took its toll on the interior, especially as it was left to sit there for a long time. According to Google, only around 1,500 manual F430s were ever made, which makes this one pretty special. First out is the seats. Four bolts holding them in and one seat belt which is connected to them. Then we can start attacking the carpet. And whilst my dad was working on the front of the car, he found something missing. What's missing? <laughs> <laughs> well, you see that hole under there, look? That's supposed to have a clutch master seat. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> wow. The master cylinder is... Why would they take another master cylinder unless there was another manual? The clutch master cylinder is attached to the clutch pedal and its job when you push down the clutch pedal is to push hydraulic fluid through the clutch system allowing you to release the clutch. Finding a second hand master cylinder on one of these could be pretty hard and brand new you're looking at around £332. Cheers guys, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so it's beyond me why that master cylinder's missing. But we'll worry about that later. For now, I'm cracking on with getting this interior back to how it should be. It's not a full detail, but the interior has been absolutely transformed by about an hour worth of cleaning. It's definitely making me feel a little bit more confident about my purchase. Okay, we have got Freddy's engine, which he kindly donated to, to us, which has a bent Conrod, one bent Conrod. And then we also have the original engine block here. We've got to make a decision now on what block we're going to use because we've got to build up an engine for this Ferrari. Bad news about the original block is in some of the cylinders, you might find it hard to see here, they are scored. Now these sleeves, you can actually replace them, but in Freddy's block, these cylinders are all good. So I think we're gonna use this block. Yeah. Now I know the Ferrari fanatics are probably not gonna like that I'm not using the original block, but for now, this is the most cost-effective option. So let's start stripping this one. And we've got a lovely new parts cleaner. Thanks, Motul. Whilst Hannah is on the cleaning duty, me and my dad are trying to work out how this engine was assembled. Before we take this engine apart, we're just taking note on how it was put together, providing it was put together actually properly. But if you look at the bottom of the rods here, that's marked with a Y and then a number. And then on this side, it's marked with an X and a number. Then again, it goes to Y and a number, an X and a number. So it constantly goes Y, X, the last cylinder, this one, it went with a Y on this side, but the one that's actually bent is also a Y marked Conrod. As we couldn't really see any pattern between the X Conrods and the Y Conrods, and it's also really difficult to find any information on this engine online, which you'll find is a problem later in the video, I could only think of one person I could turn to. We're trying to work out these Conrods because they're all marked weirdly, like, so some have X on and some have Y on. So if, it's on, the, if it's on the bottom of the cap facing you when you flip the engine upside down, I'm yeah. sure that's a batching number. To be honest, mate, unless you want to balance the rotating assembly, I wouldn't really worry too much because I'm pretty confident we get it on the Audis as well, where they're like a batching code. So you can look at it and you can go, oh, all the X's are like a certain weight, but it doesn't really matter too much as long as your codes on the side of the rod match. So, so as long as F I mate, you'll be mint. We have two crankshafts, one out of Freddy's engine and one out of the original engine. We need to make sure one of them is at least good. The crankshaft is a huge part right near the bottom of the engine. The explosion from the combustion pushes the piston and the comrod down, which makes the crankshaft rotate. Now, as we had a bent comrod on our engine, which seized the engine up, we want to make sure that that's caused no damage to the actual crankshaft. Because this part of the crankshaft is where the bearing sits. And if it's damaged here, it might not be getting the right oil feed or have the right clearances, which would cause engine failure all over again. Now, what I'm doing now with a micrometer is measuring one side of the crankshaft 
then the other side, making sure it's all even. And I'm doing this in two places for each part of the crankshaft where the bearing sits. All the engineer people are gonna say this is not an exact measurement, but no, but we, we think it's pretty good. It's the best we can do with the kit we've got, basically. Um, I'm confident with this one. Uh, let me show you what I think a bad crank looks like. This is goes straight over that, and I assume, you look at that. I don't even have to adjust the micrometer, look. Doesn't go over that, straight over that. I mean, I don't think I'll be putting that one in. There's visual light scores in that one, but we're struggling to get to see any difference in any of that crank. We're gonna say that one is good, this one for the bin. Now the engine is pretty much completely stripped. So we're gonna clean it all up in the parts washer before we can build it all back up again. But to move forward from this point, we're gonna need some parts. And there's only one place I could think of where we could get parts fast. We're gonna come here and hopefully leave with loads of Ferrari parts. Let's get shopping. We've took a trip to Euros Fairs, which have a load of new and used Ferrari parts. Their warehouse is absolutely massive. They even have full complete engines for sale. So we made sure to take a lot of photos of how the engine was assembled whilst it was on the rack in there. But we didn't come for an engine. One red bumper, one orange bumper, and a bunch of stuff which should help us build up the Ferrari engine when we get back. I don't know how much for, but We've spent a lot. Now there's loads of parts on this Ferrari that we can cross reference to different cars. And we can save a lot of money by doing that. But there's some parts like the bumpers and a lot of the seals and bearings which aren't cross reference. So they're the bits that we're buying today. And the total amount of parts we have here, it didn't look like much, but it's fitting into a Range Rover. 13,000. 887 pounds and 48 P which means we are now 73,887 pounds and 48 P into the 430 but we should have enough now to put this thing back together most of it really but we'll find out one very expensive trip later and we're back and now we can start building up the engine I think what we're going to start with are the two cylinder heads. With this being a V8, there's two cylinder heads, four pistons each side. Here's one cylinder head and here's the other. This one's upside down, but you can see here the exhaust valves and then the inlet valves on this side here. These are gonna open and close to let air in and to let all the waste out. But to make sure we're gonna get the most power out of the engine, these have got to sit perfectly flat against the top of the head and to make sure that we do so we've got to take them all out and these are held in here with little springs and the, these collets on the top of the valve but we'll take them out and we'll go from there let's do it to take them out my dad's going to use this sort of clamp which squashes the valve springs down and then once the valve springs are squashed down it can get a magnet to remove the collets which hold the valve spring onto the valves once the collets are removed we can release the clamp and then remove the valve springs which will give us access to the valve and this part right at the bottom we want that to be super clean so it sits nicely in the valve seats my dad's got a lot to get through so whilst he was doing that i put the ferrari in the lift to inspect the underneath of it found something else uh, i just noticed there's a bolt in there and a bolt in there like these brackets which are like mounted to the chassis and then on this side there's no bolt here or here so <laughs> the radiator is just completely free so we're missing some kind of bracket on the top and the bottom there well fantastic now before i bought this car i checked it out on car vertical and everything seems all good there's no records of it ever being in an accident there's no outstanding finance there's no mileage rollbacks and it's never been recorded as stolen but as this car was a track experience car for most of its life it's unlikely that a crash would have ever been recorded so i'm going to take a look over it and see if there's any signs of one we're actually doing all right here so underneath here it looks like the standard suspension is adjustable coilovers so we can adjust the ride height up and down it's also like looks like it's adaptive so maybe it's got a uh, some kind of adaptive suspension to harden and soften it when you're in different modes everything here 
looks pretty good for a 2005 car. Anything on this side, this side looks fine, and that side looks fine. Let's have a look underneath. Right, underneath. I'm guessing this is all part of a rear diffuser. <laughs> What's all that? <laughs> Look at all these bolts. <laughs> they didn't want this falling off. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. No, like a small scratch there, but nothing really that bad. Oh, a little bit of a corner missing there, but yeah. With the valves now out of the cylinder head, we now have another job, the valve seals. The seal sits on the valve here and stops any oil from getting on top of the valve or inside the combustion chamber. Normally, when the oil's on the on the springs and everything at night, mm. and then it runs down, it runs down the stem of the valve. Yeah. You know, it runs down the stem of the valve, past the seal, and then goes and rests on top of your piston. So when you start up in the morning, it smokes like uh, it smokes a lot. And they're in every single one. And that's exactly what will happen if we have bad valve seals. We'll get a lot of smoke on startup in the mornings. Or really bad ones could just smoke all the time. But before we put new seals in, we've got to clean up the valves. Next step. Now that they're clean, we've got to make sure they mate nicely on the surface around here. So we use this paste, which is like kind of like grinding paste almost. And that's going to go in the seat. Slide it in and we're gonna grind it. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! You see how that's all nice and clean? If you look at this one, there's a good one that's not very good. Oh yeah, and that's see? all dirty. All right. Yeah. Can you see how that's the seat? Oh no, it's nice, nice and, and clean. Ah. Yeah, all the power. <laughs> <laughs> right, 32 to go. Well, 31 now. My dad and myself cracked on with grinding the rest of the valves in place before moving on to the next step. Okay, valves are clean, seated in. All we've got to do now, we're going to keep the same springs on there, but we need to change the valve seals. We've got this full seal kit. These are the new valve seals. And as I mentioned, they're pretty vital to replace when doing an engine build like this. My dad's using a socket to push the oil seal in place. And once the seal is sat in place like that, we can then push the valve in from underneath. And it should fit nice and snug. Then it's time for both the valve springs to sit on top of the valve. And we've got to compress this all to put the collet in place. Now we saw a video on TikTok of a guy doing some kind of hack to get the collet in place using a socket and a piece of plastic and we were dying to see whether that actually worked because if it did it would save a lot of his time fiddling around with the collets right, the collets are in okay okay plastic bag and this is a good idea this oh. clamp yeah go and squeeze it Oh no. Oh no, it's gonna launch, <laughs> it's gonna launch. We failed on our first attempt, but on the second? Yes! Hey, did it go, did it work? Yeah! <laughs> Once we'd sussed the hack out, we were moving quick time, putting all the valves, the springs, and the collets back on each one. And there we go. Every valve spring is in. That head is just about ready, but we need to test it to make sure a valve, well, all of them are actually properly in because if the valve opens and it then drops it into the cylinder, it could be drastic and we don't want to do that. So uh, we're going to test them now by just knocking the valve down to open it and making sure everything stays in place. Is this how Ferrari would do it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whee! One cylinder head ready for the engine. Um, we've just got to do that one now. With the cylinder heads complete, we can then turn our attention to the actual engine block. And one thing we need to do before we reassemble it is make sure the cylinder sleeves are nice and smooth. At the minute, you can see there's a lot of scratches and grooves in there, but nothing that can't be fixed. And to sort these out, we need to rub a bit of oil in the sleeve. <laughs> 
And then my dad's going to use this tool to hone out the cylinder. And there we have one smooth cylinder sleeve. Just another seven to go. All of the sleeves are nice and smooth. This engine is effectively ready to build back up. Let's go. It's actually a sticker gasket then. And you think it sticks on this bit? It, yeah, well, you think it does. <laughs> Next gasket. Does that have a sticker on it? No stickers on that one. Click. Or is it beep? Oh yeah, beep. We're in a predicament. I've just ordered a workshop manual for the Ferrari engine, which is also a Maserati engine, but it only shows you torque specs and workshop pr procedures for serviceable items. So things like clutches, thermostats, auxiliary belts, nothing as big as this. And we've since found out that Ferrari don't give out torque specs or repair procedures for jobs as big as this because it's supposed to be done by Ferrari and not just a bloke in a garage in Leicester. So if you're a Ferrari technician, then the comment section is open for you. We need your help because I'm not sure Ferrari are gonna help us. Although we're trying to put one of their cars back on the road. And our next step is to do the piston ring gap. We've taught this to our spec. It's just tight, okay? And But the next thing is to do all the piston ring gaps. That's what we've got to do next. But we can't do that, one, without the piston ring specs and two without the piston rings. They haven't arrived yet, so we're stuck. How can you order those items yeah. for a big strip down if they can't give you the specs yeah, to that, tighten them up? That is actually quite true. How, yeah, how, in the UK, they can sell you structural parts for a Porsche, but they can't tell you how to fit them. So Ferrari must be able to sell you parts. But then they've got to fit them. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make it, it doesn't make any sense. Thanks to you guys, I've managed to get my hands on a workshop manual, but it is for a Maserati. But this Maserati engine is also used in the 430. Because the Italians like to share, and later in the video, we find that the French also like to share with the Italians as well. The cylinders are now ready for the pistons. But before we do that, we need to change the piston rings. There's three of them on this piston. The lower piston ring is called the oil ring, which stops oil getting into the combustion chamber. And then the top two piston rings are used for compression to keep a nice tight seal in the combustion chamber. And if those were worn out, then you'd lose a lot of power and you'd definitely be burning a lot of oil. First, my dad's using an old piston ring to clean up the recesses of where the new piston rings will go. Then before we fit the ring into the piston, we're gonna slide the ring in the cylinder. Now you'll notice a little gap in the piston ring. This is called piston ring gap. And this has to be a specific size. If the gap is too big, as I mentioned, you'll burn a lot of oil and we won't have the right compression. But if the gap is too small, then when the engine heats up, the piston ring will expand and it will have nowhere to go but to score up the inside of the cylinder sleeve. Our piston ring gap is all good, so now we're loading up the piston rings into the piston. And now that they're in the piston, we can begin to put them finally in the cylinders. This special bit of kit squashes the rings into the piston and then we can knock the piston into the cylinder. And we've just got to do that seven more times. Oh, it's well heavier now. Right. I told you it's heavier. Old dad. <laughs> <laughs> we're moving, we're moving, and now it's time for the bottom end bearings. The funny thing about these bottom end bearings is that they make different ones depending on the engine. We've all got different sizes, different tolerances. The only thing we could do is look at the part number on the old ones and match them up. Easy as that, but fairly simple to go in. The big end bearings slide in at the bottom of the conrod. Wow, wow, wow. And once they're in the bottom of the conrod, it's time for the main bearings. These bearings are what the crankshaft rotates on. We have an issue and we don't think it can be solved. So if, this, if the engine goes bang, 
and it's because of this reason it's not our fault okay so check out these bearings here the main bearings they slide from left to right which doesn't look right because then it's covering no. over the sort of Actually. oil gallery there like it, it if that covers over then the oil is not going to get through onto there but on the old bearings which you can see here they've got a tab on the top here big one to stop it from sliding left to right but on the new ones they've got only a small tab compared to the old bearings so this is going to be a little bit more serious than we first thought and confusing if you go on the website here uh, you can see that the bearing that we're after is 195307, which is also used in the Maserati engines. But if you click on the Maserati one, the part number has now superseded, so it's changed to 286832, which is the bearing that we've got. But if you click on the Ferrari one, there's no supersession to that part number. The part number has stayed the same, which in our heads doesn't make any sense because why would they change it for one engine and not the other when the engines are exactly the same? Well, they might be exactly the same, exactly the same in my opinion. Now, we didn't want to run the risk of ruining the engine because one of these bearings has slid over and covered an oil gallery. So instead, we went back and ordered the original part number from Ferrari with the bigger tab on it. We have got, well, I've ordered the correct part number from Marinello Parts. It's come next day. Uh, yeah. yeah, and it's got the big tab on. We're going to put these in. I don't know why for our, uh, Maserati have superseded their one, but we're going to ignore that, and we're going to put these in. At least now we can have some peace of mind that we're putting in the same part number as what came out of the engine. And was they were in, it's time for the crankshaft to go in. What are you doing now, Tony? There we are. I don't know. And it's back onto the other half of the big end bearings, which slide into the conrod cap. And then the conrod cap meets the rest of the conrod with some new bolts going in there, making sure to match the numbers on the conrod cap to the conrod. Is it beeping yet? Can you not hear that, really? Oh, I can't hear it. <laughs> I'm in charge of talking everything up because my dad can't hear the beep of the torque wrench. And the conrod so bolts have a torque setting and then an angle you have to turn them to. Oh yeah, I could use that one. Could you hear that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and once I've talked all the conrod bolts up, it's time to prep the crankcase so the other half of it can join together. It says in the manual to run a bead of flange sealant across the crankcase in before it meets, so that's exactly what we're doing. And with the main bearings installed on the other half of the crankcase, we can now slide it together. why we needed the manual because the, even these washers are machined on one side so they have one way of going on and we just whacked them all on so I'm gonna put it all on now the right way all of these stages are super vital one mistake here could mean the whole engine would have to come back out again and stripped completely apart I'm adding all new seals into the oil pump and the water pump which is built as one and it's now joined back together it's all together, it's looking good. We've got a new rear main seal to go in, which my dad's about to put in. Go on. Yeah! <laughs> no! Okay, next on is the cylinder heads, right and left. But to time this engine up, we need to know top dead center of cylinder number one, which is this cylinder here. Top dead centre being when the piston is at the highest point and then we time the engine up based on that. Now to find this, we've got a DTI gauge here and we're going to turn the crank over and make sure we get this absolutely bang on TDC. The engine is going to have a little bit of float, which means the piston is going to be at the top even when we're turning it sometimes. So we've got to make sure we're bang on that. So this is how we're going to do it. First, my dad's going to turn the engine clockwise and once this piston gets to the highest point, it will give me the highest reading on the DCI gauge. I'm then going to mark it on our contraption that we've built here on the flywheel side. Then my dad's going to go back, turn the engine anti-clockwise and as soon as it hits that same reading as before, I'm going to make another mark 
on our contraption. The top dead centre will be between those two marks which I've done with a really thick pen. <laughs> I've not helped myself but there's not much float in the engine so boom. Time for the cylinder heads. Of course you can't put the cylinder heads on without the head gasket. So on goes a brand new head gasket, both sides. I put the washers onto a screwdriver first, which helps me slide the washer over the stud. And I do the same for the nuts as well. Two heads on, head bolts on or head nuts on. You know it's serious when the glasses come out. Now the procedure to tighten the head nuts is 60 newton meters. And once that's done, you then go back and turn them an extra 90 degrees. And this has to be done from the middle, working outwards. And it is really important that we get this right. That extra 90 degrees on the 60 newton meters of torque made these head bolts pretty tight. After that, I can then put in the valve lifters. I hope all of you guys watching are managing to follow along because this is as hard for me to explain as it is for me to do. This is the second engine I've ever rebuilt. And now with the cylinder heads and the camshafts on, we could begin to start thinking about the timing of the engine. We've got it wrong. So we thought piston number one was here, then it worked all the way down, but we read the manual upside down um, and piston number one is all the way over here which means we've got the timing for the top dead center thing wrong. So if we got that wrong and then we timed it up, it wouldn't have worked and it would have broke the engine. So now we're gonna have to do piston number one, which is here, work out what top dead center is on there. So when the piston's right at the top and mark it here, then we can begin timing the whole engine. Okay, two steps forward, one step back. So we're doing the same procedure as before, but this time the cylinder heads are on. And once we've found top dead centre, we can now start adding all the chains, which keeps the bottom half of the engine in time with the top half of the engine. You can see we're using a photo that I took before we took it apart to put this thing back together. Just pure genius. This is a nightmare. There's a really complicated way of how to time this engine. And if I try and explain it, I'll lose myself. But in the most simple terms, we've got to keep this piston at top dead center. And then if you just come around here, the cams here, there's a little dot on the cam there and a little dot on the cam there. They've got to align. These dots have got to align with these little grooves here, both sides as well. And the way you adjust this top, so you wouldn't do these bolts here. You undo these bolts and that alert allows you to turn the cam without moving the chain and the whole engine. This is so vital because this controls when the valves open to let fuel and air in and to let the exhaust gases out. And if they open and close at the wrong time, they could be hitting into the piston. So we've got to make sure that this is absolutely spot on. Okay, if we've done this right, which it should turn over now. So let's check it all still stays in the right place. So it should be coming up now. Okay, keep coming. Slow, slow, keep going. Yeah. Yeah, that's on, that's on, that's on, that's on. We're on and we're timed up and it works. It actually spins. Can I go home now? <laughs> <laughs> Vital stage is done and it's on to the final pieces. I'm about to put on the chain cover. I've put in a new seal on it. I've run a line of sealant around the edge and a new gasket on it as well. And I can knock it onto the side of the engine. There's then two cam variator sensors, which sit inside the head. And after that, I can put on the rocker cover with a new gasket as well, of course. I'm happy with that. I can't put the other rocker cover on yet because we're missing a sensor over here but for a non-professional and someone who was building cars in a restaurant car park four years ago to put a ferrari engine back together and now it actually turns over is a pretty solid achievement i think but now it's going to get a little harder and of course we have an issue with the gearbox but let me take it back inside here is the remains of 
the manual gearbox, the original manual gearbox. And let's be honest, unless you're Rain Man, this is not getting repaired. Like, I just can't, we don't know if there's gonna be missing parts out of this, we have no diagrams out of this, we've got all the gears, the selectors, the shafts. I mean, I have no experience with rebuilding gearboxes. Do you? Bit, but not when they're in that state. No, so it, we, we're willing to accept defeat on this until we saw the price of a gearbox from Ferrari. It's expensive. In my opinion, it's expensive. <laughs> a brand new gearbox after VAT would cost you over £30,000. So buying one of them was out of the question. So second hand, you're looking at £15,000 for a gearbox and they're an automatic one. Of course, we've got a gated manual box. But then we figured out that the gearbox that from the automatic and the manual are exactly the same. The only difference is the shifter. Well, we hope they're exactly the same. So I managed to get a second-hand gearbox for £4,000. There's an issue. Here it is. This came off a fire-damaged Ferrari in Poland and there's a hole in the side. We're hoping it hasn't caused any damage to the inside of it, but this is the mechanism for the F1 gearbox, the automatic one. It automatically selects the gears with hydraulic shifters. I think if we take this part off, and of course the broken part off, we can make this into a manual box, and we would have a manual box for £4,000, providing there's no damage here. Buying this box was a bit of a risk, but so was buying the car, and some risks pay off, and others don't. I'm just hoping that this risk does. I hope there's no more damage inside that gearbox. Doesn't look bad. From oh, it's... that's been in water. Has it? Oh, how did it get rusty? Because it's been in water. <laughs> oh. oh, maybe it isn't good. Oh, it's the Titanic. The inside of the gearbox, for some reason, looked really wet and not with oil with water. So we had no choice but to start stripping this one apart to check for damage. Ooh. 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 Yeah. No. The oh, oh my god. <laughs> well it's a good job we took it apart. Look at the bearing. Oh my days. So the fire's gone in there and caused destruction. Absolute perished. Do you think the oil set on fire that was in the gearbox? Oh. oh, it could have. Oh. Look, it's all black in here, isn't it? Ah. Matt's good facts. Call. Which ain't good news. Not at it? all, is it, really? <laughs> Not when you're trying to build a gearbox out of something that's set on fire. <laughs> Do these even turn? <laughs> yeah, like that, all those bearings in here could look like that. I think that was the car got it off. That does not look good. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Do you know when you're on eBay and you're looking for a gearbox and you assume that? Yeah, well, it's four grand as opposed to 15. Yeah, it's four grand for a reason. So now... <laughs> Thank you. So now... Thank you. So now we have, well, two bad gearboxes really, and I don't even know where we're gonna start or even finish with this. I've got to order loads of bearings for this, as I've got to order a lot of parts for the engine. But before I carry on with this, I mentioned at the start of the video that the French like to share with the Italian and I'm about to find out whether that's true or not. When I picked up the Ferrari, it was missing a window regulator and there was only a block of wood holding the window up, which was bad news. The good news was we have a regulator on this side. And the other good news is that we found the window regulator but it's just missing a motor. And we've taken off the motor of this window regulator, as you can see here, and just checked the part numbers on the back, and it's a Bosch motor. For a brand new window motor for the Ferrari, it's 178 pounds. And the cheapest one I could find second hand was 120, and that's the wrong side. But I copied the part number into eBay, and then found out that that motor could be used on a well-known French car, in my opinion, called a Peugeot 406. And here we have the motor of the French car, which there is some slight differences. 
but generally it looks pretty oh in fact that one is a little bit longer it may work it may not work the connections are slightly different but they're only a two pin connection and a two pin connection so we could make that work but this one could possibly work it's not exactly the same but it could work so this is where things get a little bit hard like everything we've put on now was how we found the engine so we've took it apart and we've put it back together but everything from now on is stuff that we've not experienced before and we're just going off diagrams we're just trying to work out what goes in here and then the inlet manifold fold goes on it but for now i think let's just carry on building up what we can in this middle section here in the last video, we managed to rebuild the full Ferrari engine without any experience with Ferrari engines before. We're on and we're timed up and it works. It actually spins, which left us at this point here. But there's still a lot of vital parts to go on. We've got the knock sensors, which sit in the middle of the engine and two oil coolers. And on top of that, a bracket, which holds a lot of things down. But we're just going off photos here and we're hoping we're right. I think the next step to go on, we can get all the ancillaries on because this engine sits the way it sits in the car now. So when you, all the ancillaries and the belt and everything is all at the front of the engine. So if we put the engine in and then try and put the ancillaries on, it's, you're just not gonna get to it because it's at the very front of the car rather than being at the back like the Mercer Lago. So I think next step is to try and fit alternator and everything like that. Let's try it. First thing is, ah, <laughs> oh, I kneeled on that. <laughs> Power steering pump, okay? We're gonna have to remove a bolt from the chain cover to hold the power steering pump in place. And I guess we're gonna learn these little things as we go along. Because we didn't take this engine apart, it is 10 times harder to put it back together. Once that bolt's in, there's two more bolts which hold it to the side of the engine. And that should hold it in place. Next thing, is the aircon condenser. Now this doesn't just simply bolt to the side of the engine. You have to have it, they have a shim and I'm pretty sure it's just an afterthought, but it looks like that, but we've had to make one um, because we're not buying one from Ferrari for probably like a tenner. The shim looks like this and it's actually only £1.48, but with a two to three week wait. And I'm not waiting that long for it. Right. Puller. Power steering, aircon, alternator. The alternator sits in the middle of the V of the engine. This adjuster at the back, see that? Oh yeah. Moving the alternator so you can line the belt up properly. So we probably should put the belt on as well. Next up is the belt. Again, all we're using here is a photo for reference because the only workshop manual we have is for the Maserati engine, which is slightly different. But we've just about worked out how the auxiliary belt goes on. Then we've just got to make sure that the alternator is sitting nice and true with the belt. And that should just about do it. Tony Armstrong here, reporting live from Matt Armstrong's unit. Today we are rebuilding the Ferrari. Don't say my name because nobody knows it. Matt's dad here, reporting <laughs> live from Matt's unit. There's this pipe which sits here. I'm not sure what it does. Do you think it carries oil? It's oil, isn't it? But we are missing a pipe, surprise, surprise, which goes from here to here. And if we order it, it's probably going to be two to three weeks. But, 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 luckily we've just rebuilt an Audi RS6 and we have a lot of spare parts. This part was after, off the Audi RS6 and I think it can help us rebuild a Ferrari because it's wow. almost perfect. <laughs> so if we cut that down to size, we could use an RS6 hose on that. It absolutely works and it, it looks the same type of hose as this one. So. You watch that one blow up when we try and do like a gumball rally or something. <laughs> <laughs> My dad trimmed down the RS6 hose. Oh, OEM. And it was a perfect fit. Sometimes you have to improvise. It's either that or wait weeks for the new part. 
and probably pay over the odds because of Ferrari prices. Next thing to go on is the inlet manifold. That doesn't look like it's supposed to go on that, does it? <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> now this engine has port injection, which means the fuel injectors sit in the inlet manifold, meaning that the fuel is injected before the combustion chamber. So the air and fuel mixture is mixed before it goes into the combustion chamber as opposed to direct injection, which is injected directly into the combustion chamber. There's pros and cons to both of these methods, but for now, we're just worrying about the port injection because that's what we've got. My dad's applying some silicon grease to the seals on the injectors and then slotting them in place in the inlet manifold. And as the Ferrari has a V8, there's one injector for each cylinders, meaning there's eight injectors. So I'm doing the other side. Then I connect up all the electrical connectors to the injectors. Exciting times, it's time to take it off and we're on to the next step. One step closer to getting it in the car and starting it and hearing it for the first time ever. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> what we're trying to do now is hang this up so we can get to this side because now it's time for the clutch and the flywheel. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Right, next up flywheel these are super light and quite small but the lighter it is the higher and faster it's going to rev not the higher the faster it's going to rev and this has all been balanced because you can see all the little drilled holes here to make sure that it's nicely balanced and we got this from scuderia parts shout out to them as well and they've even gave you guys a discount code so if you need any Ferrari or Maserati parts, you can go grab them. And I've put a link in the description with the discount code, as I mentioned as well. So they're helping me out, they're helping you guys out as well, which is good. New flywheel bolts and washer goes in here. And then we've got to torque these up. The flywheel bolts have to be torqued up in like a star-shaped pattern to make sure it's evenly pressed onto the side of the engine. So this is a twin-plated clutch and it's got like a clutch plate here and another clutch plate there i assume for the smoother gear changes we've got all new bolts for the clutch and we apply a little bit of loctite to them okay so there's a line so we're assuming that that line would line up with that because that's what it's balanced to correct once we've lined the clutch up with the flywheel we can bolt it all together and torque all the bolts up of course Oh, spot on. <laughs> it's looking pretty good now. And now we've got the clutch on and the flywheel. It's time for the gearbox. Or what's left of it. As I mentioned, we now have one gearbox, which is in pieces and incomplete, and one gearbox, which was involved in a fire. Well, uh, there goes half a million dollars. And all the bearings or anything plastic inside have completely melted. But the thing is, we've got to make this work. We bought the Ferrari for £60,000 and we've already spent just short of £18,000 on it. For a second-hand gearbox, it's £15,000, which is just going to push the build budget way too high. And a manual 430 at the minute is selling for around £100,000. On my right-hand side is the gearbox, which I bought from eBay for £4,000. And on my left-hand side, is the gearbox that we got with the car or what's left of it. And this was stripped apart because there was something wrong with it. Now, <laughs> everything on this side is completely burnt to pieces and there's loads of little bearings which are just melted. And even if you look in the casing, it is fully black in there and there's loads of little bearings in there which have set on fire. So I think our plan is to use the original casing and trying to make one good gearbox out of two bad ones. Here we go. <laughs> now there's two shafts in a gearbox, but we'll get onto that later. Right now we're looking at the secondary shaft, which has came out of the fire damaged gearbox, and this one, which is the one which came with the car. Now if you look at this one which came with the car, the gear at the end looks smooth and rounded, and we think it looks worn, but the bearing above it looks in pretty good shape. Whereas if you look at the fire damage one, the gears look nice and sharp. So we're gonna use that shaft, but take the bearing off the one that we got with the car and put it on the fire damage one, if that makes sense. And we're also in Dave DTB's workshop here, hence why there's a noble in the background. I didn't do the fire 
I know, boy. We're nicking Dave's bearing press. <laughs> Ferrari 430. How did you have one of them here? <laughs> All the bearings have got to be pressed onto the shaft. And we need a pretty strong bearing press. So thanks, Dave. Once Dave had pressed it on with a special Ferrari tool, we can then start assembling the rest of the parts which go on the shaft. As my dad took apart the burnt gearbox, he knows how this shaft goes back together, almost using it as a reference. If one bearing wasn't enough, on goes another bearing. All the bearings we're using off the one that we got with the car, because they look pretty good, if not new. Then to hold all that on, a bit of Loctite, and then a locking ring over the top, which we assume needs to be torqued up to a top secret torque spec, which we're gonna have to blur out. You've done the proper torque spec. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? Yeah. Right, now just a million more gears to go. After that, we can begin with putting gears on. The next gear to go on, we're gonna use from the fire damage gearbox. Just because we were missing that gear from the gearbox that we got with the car. But the rest of the gears we'll be using from the one we got with the car. As they all look good. Again, both of those gears have to be pressed onto this shaft. As they're gonna rotate with it. Right, so here's the shaft that we've just done. This is out of the burnt one, which has melted bearings in. That's the secondary shaft, which connects with that one like a bike. This is the shaft out of the gearbox that we got with the car. We've got to make this look like this and then put it into that housing over there. <laughs> oh, if, if you've lost us, Bear with. <laughs> now we're trying to avoid using anything from the burnt gearbox. So I'm looking at the gears that we got with the car to try and build up the primary shaft exactly the same as the one that came out the burnt gearbox. The primary shaft is the one that is spun by the engine. The top one in this diagram. And the secondary shaft is the one that sends the power to the wheels. And they're kind of interlinked together. But everything has to be spot on. And if something is one millimeter out, it can cause the whole gearbox not to work. Right now, my dad's building up the primary shaft, the one that is constantly spinning with the engine, as I mentioned. And we're just using the burnt gearbox primary shaft as a reference of how this thing goes back together. And at the minute, it's looking pretty good as it seems we have all the gears and all the parts to make this shaft complete. That's it, isn't it? Yeah, it's, it's made up of so many bearings, shims and spacers. It is unreal. Such a complex job. Right, this shaft is completed, we think, and everything is the right way. Now we're gonna put it inside the box. So this is the casing from the one that we got with the car. So this is a selector fork, and this is how you select the gears. So it'll, it'll slide into gear, lock that gear into place. I don't exactly know how this works, like, I don't think anyone does really. No, I mean, I don't. no one does. <laughs> <laughs> At least we're trying. At least we're giving it a go. And if it don't work, we've learned. And then we'll keep doing it until it does work. So Inside the box, there's more bearings and a spacer as well. We're just hoping that this all works. <laughs> this is how they did it at Ferrari. <laughs> mm. Both shafts going together, interlinked. And then they needed a little bit of persuasion to just knock it into place. Which I did gracefully. Insert! 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 <laughs> oh, you just got... Ferrari! 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 <laughs> <laughs> Once the two shafts are resting in the gearbox, we can continue to build them up. With even more gears. And the selector forks as well. And we know we're doing it right at the minute because we can see all the selector forks are all lining up. These forks slide forward and backwards to lock the car in gear or back out of gear. You can see how it works here, but it's still pretty complex. Still moving. That's promising. <laughs> My dad removed the gearbox filter Whoa. and it was absolutely caked up. <laughs> <laughs> we still don't know the real reason why the original gearbox was taken apart. But judging by all that metal on the filter, it didn't look good. But everything that's gone back into the box now looks in good condition. 
and the final touches were done by Dave. It just needs that on there. <laughs> <laughs> Certified. <laughs> and just when you thought it was done, there's one more gear, the reverse gear. Figure out which way around this went on. Groove yeah, on I can the have a look. I can outside. have a look. Show me the groove. <laughs> <laughs> There's the groove. <laughs> oh yeah, that is the groove. Right. No groove on the outside, so this groove is going on the inside. And if you haven't watched part two, go watch that before you carry on watching this video. Yeah, it's <laughs> in the top right hand corner. And then oh. here it is. Here it is. Goes in there, like that. Wow, look at that. It's not fitted properly yet, but yeah, that's, but that's how, how it works. goes. Reverse gear. And it reverses the whole thing. <laughs> really? We still we don't really know how it works, but we're, at least we're trying to learn. Because you're using another gear, it spins the shaft the other, the other way. Oh. Yeah. How did we not know this from the start? <laughs> Whatever this gearbox ain't got in now, it ain't never having in. <laughs> I'm gonna dab on the haters. <laughs> <laughs> Now onto the final pieces of the gearbox. After we spent such a long time working out how this thing went back together, and if it actually works, what an achievement it is. So not only rebuild the engine, but also the gearbox. But it's not only the engine and gearbox we've got to rebuild. There's something else. Supposedly, the gearbox is now all in one piece. But the thing is with this gearbox, it's also a differential as well. So to actually drive the wheels, the gearbox will go in gear and then it will spin the wheels here and we don't have any, and I've just noticed, look, it, something got caught here. Ooh. So we need the differential. And if we come over here, we have one burnt differential and one differential in a lot of pieces. So next job, I'm gonna take this apart and rebuild this. I think there's new bearings and everything on this, but there's parts we're missing off this. So I think, again, it's a case of out of two bad ones, make one good one, and we can whack it in. My dad's gone, so this one is down to me. Let's do it. Also, forgot to mention, uh, these gears here, I think it's the pinion, maybe. So these are gonna meet up with the teeth inside there so we're making sure we've used the these are the teeth from the burnt gearbox and these are the teeth out of the burnt gearbox so those two are going to meet so i don't want to mix and match the actual teeth because they've probably been gapped to the right size or that type of stuff as well we don't actually have any on the um one that we got in bits so at least we're going to keep these two together so they know each other <laughs> Let's do it. This is one burnt differential, which is complete. And this is one incomplete non-burnt differential. And it's the secondary shaft here, which is going to spin the differential. So right now I'm taking apart the burnt differential and I'm going to use all the bearings and all the good parts out of the good differential to build it back up again. Right, <laughs> from taking one apart, I'm now about to put this one back together. I have no idea what these do or what they're supposed to do. So that is that, that way, way around, wouldn't it? Yeah. yeah okay. So this is like a, it looks like a clutch plate inside the diff. That goes in there. Do you reckon it meant to go in a certain way? I did think about that earlier, but I think these are evenly spaced. So I think yeah, so there's no, okay, so that's in. There's gonna be a lot of people that go, oh, you can't do that, you can't do that. But you shouldn't laugh at someone for trying because we're trying and if it doesn't work, it's okay because it's my car and if I break it, it's only my problem. So don't worry, everyone that says I can't do it, I'm giving it a try, okay? Here we go, trying. <laughs> now I'm knocking on the burnt gear onto the good diff and it all lines up pretty good. We're gonna add some Loctite to the bolts and again, we have no way of finding the torque specs for this diff. We barely found them for the engine. So we're just gonna make sure that they're all torqued up evenly. It's the best we can do. Is it a recipe for disaster? Well, I guess we find out when we finally start the car and try to drive it. Next thing is the big outer bearing. I've gotta knock this on with a piece of wood 
because Dave's closed his workshop and we can't seal his bearing press anymore. But the piece of wood did it. After that, it's the outer casing and these all have fresh bearings in as well. So it's looking good for us at this stage. We have to push this over the top and then the shims, more roller bearings, these are the roller bearings out of the burnt gearbox, so I'm going to swap these over to the non-burnt gearbox and pop them in. More shims, and then it is all held in with a C-clip. But we had a small problem on trying to get this C-clip into place. It was pretty difficult. We're struggling now. This casing here, has to go on there like that. Then this C-clip here has to go on top like that and hold it all in place. But we cannot get it pressured down far enough. So we're going to try a different technique and actually start putting the diff inside the gearbox. Now, the way this is going to work is the engine spins that and that rotates to turn the wheels which to turn the wheels spins this pinion round here like that and the whole thing turns the wheels and you get power sent to the wheels. The thing is supposedly this gearbox is in neutral and uh, if it were in neutral when we spin this because this is going to be constantly spinning because the engine's on it I don't think that should be spinning and it's meant to be in neutral but it's not I don't think it is so we could have got something seriously wrong here. The only thing I could think is if we put this diff in, bolt it together, then spin it, and then if we if we start seeing the, the wheels turning, we've definitely done something wrong because it shouldn't spin. But let, let's see, let's see, because this could be a game changer now. That's fully in now. I've seen yeah. it just sink in. Right. Ah! Oh, it's not turning it. It's not turning it now. So do you think it just needed a bit of pressure, like a bit of resistance? Well, the only way to find out now is if we put this casing on, yeah, then knock it into gear, and then we can see whether it spins. Turns. <laughs> no one's going to... If you get what's going on, well done to you if you made it this far, because I don't. <laughs> <laughs> We were so close to finding out whether this gearbox was built properly and whether it all works. We should be able to spin the primary shaft without the wheels spinning whilst it's in neutral. The thing I have noticed, Matt, yeah. is it is still spinning. We'll see, we'll see, let's see if this goes in. Right, so it's little spacer, then Bearing. big boy. Yep. And now, the moment of truth. This is just not ideal. Right. I'm going to persuade it. It's nearly on with this screwdriver. Here we go. Boom. What? On. But it's still spinning. So, I, yeah, but I, I still, I, what I'm going to do is put, I'm going to put it on how it should. Yeah. Right. Right. Put the bolts in. Let's tighten this up. I'm not feeling positive though. You think it's still going to spin? Right. I'm not looking forward to holding that and turning it and seeing if it doesn't work because this has literally took days to get <laughs> to this point. Like that. Right, okay. When I'm spinning this shaft here, right? Oh no. That's neutral. Is that 100% neutral? Wait, it's working. It's working. It's oh, working. My. Wait, let me hold this end. Oh. No, it's not working. No, it's not. Something is wrong. It's got to be stuck in gear. Imagine if it, were, if it was in neutral and you're pushing the car forward, it shouldn't turn this because that will be turning the engine over. And look, I turn the wheels forward and it is, no. it's turning the engine over. No. So it's stuck in gear. All those selectors are all in the middle, nice and free. Right, that's in gear. Yeah, I can't even... Turn that round, like the gear's so hard. We might have put a wrong spacer in, spaced out slightly wrong, and it's just catching it. If you know, let me know in the comment section below. 
If you don't, please don't comment. You're with me. <laughs> Wait, full on plot twist. We think it works. Well, it does work. There's a thing called gearbox drag, which obviously there's no oil in the gearbox and that's gonna cause it to drag a bit in neutral. But check this out, we can actually get it to turn. Hannah's gonna hold it, hold the drive shafts in place, and I'm just gonna spin round the engine. Here we go. Yes, look at that. It's spinning and it's working. There's a lot of drag. But again, <laughs> there's no oil in there. It works. Right, to get this into the Ferrari, we've got to attach the gearbox to the Ferrari engine. But before we do that, I've still got a load of sensors and a load of little things which still need to be fitted to the Ferrari engine before we do so. And the same with the gearbox. So my dad's gonna do the gearbox, I'm gonna do the engine, and then we're gonna put them together. Let's hope it goes well. Getting to anything on the engine whilst the engine's in the engine bay can be really difficult. So we've got to make sure it's all attached now. Coolant temperature sensor. On goes the coolant temperature sensor. And then there's all of these cam sensors to go on. All of these cam sensors are numbered. Ferrari do that. The issue is they don't number the wiring loom. And as we never took this engine apart, we have no idea where they plug into and all of these plugs are the same so you can easily mix them all round even the crank sensors can be mixed up with the cam sensors so at the minute we're just going to guess and someone has marked them here with their own marking we have no idea what that marking means because we're now plugging it onto a sensor which we've bought so there's no other marking so we can only plug it in what we think is right but if it's not right then the engine literally will not start yeah it's quite a difficult one really but I guess we won't find out until we turn the key. Do you think we're in the right position? No comment. Meanwhile my dad's over on the gearbox trying to remove the old release bearing. The release bearing is in charge of releasing the clutch. You can see here it pushing against the clutch to release it. Hey! Look at that! Sometimes the bearing wears on these and they become noisy or they can even start to have leaky seals which would get clutch fluid all over your clutch which wouldn't be great. So on goes the new one and then the last thing for the gearbox is the gearbox oil filter which just goes in the back here. Job done. It's just about ready, just, just, just about. The only thing we're missing now is spark plugs and coil packs, we've got the injectors in. And then also one thing that we're going to have to put on before it goes into the engine bay is the exhaust manifold because we won't get to all these bolts here. But we have got some special exhaust manifolds. Check these bad boys out. These are Capristo long tube headers, which should actually increase the performance of the 430. That's if it starts. Scuderia Parts kindly sorted us out with these Capristo headers and if the Ferrari does start then we've got a full exhaust system on the way for it. But for now, the headers go on first. I would love to put the engine in first and start it and see if it runs but you can't actually put the engine in without the gearbox because this gearbox has got to go on this bit on the top of the gearbox, there's a canister on here, a, like a tank, which holds all the oil for the engine. So you have to have that on to put the engine in, which is like the first time I've ever seen it because it's a dry sump. So this has got to go on next, I think. But we're moving, we're moving. This was an automatic gearbox, which we convert into a manual. So a lot of the places where it had holes for sensors just have blanking plugs now apart from this part on the diff, which we missed out. There's loads of oil lines going to this gearbox and there's one missing here. Come here, come here, come here. Check that, check that, check that. Look, there's thread there going in there. Two oil lines going in here, which I assume feed the diff and there's thread here as well. Now we've looked on the old case in here. This bit is fully perished and we thought that was a line. It's actually a sensor. No, it's not. It's a regulator, isn't it? An oil regulator. And what the hell is that? 
We don't know what that is yet. The big one is a regulator valve, which is £319.66. Before that, oh, wounded. I'm going to have to buy that. And then, what the hell is that other one? This one turned out to be a pressure switch for the Ediff. Good news is they got it in. Bad news is £170 plus that for a silly sensor. More expense added to a never-ending Ferrari build. But the good news is we can put these sensors on with the engine in the car. So right now we're just going to attach the gearbox to the engine. And with that done, we'll then be able to add the oil canister to the gearbox, which will allow us to insert the engine oil. But there's a problem with that. And this is the canister which holds the oil. That is oh no. Oh. Oh. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no. Guess what? Oh. You put the pipe on wrong. This pipe was meant to go to this part of the oil canister, but it was nowhere near. And turns out I didn't put the pipe on wrong. Look, it's all completely different. Is that a brand new one? Look, the part, this has got two parts coming out the edge and then some going down the bottom. It looks like we've got an oil canister for a Ferrari 360 and not a 430. I painted this. <laughs> I painted that. I don't think that's even off this car. There's another grand I've had to pay. This is just getting too expensive now. Another setback. But luckily, I was able to order one, which should arrive soon. Time to apply some more parts. Vital part, starter motor. This is going to go on right down the bottom here. And then we'll be able to turn the car on. This should be the last piece to go on before we put the engine and gearbox into the car. So close now. So obviously we're still missing a few parts. Some should arrive today, but our main goal is just to see if this car runs and all we need for it to run is oil, fuel, and ignition. And I think we might have enough for that. We don't have that oil tank just yet, but it may come just in time. Let's see if we can get it running. This will be the last time we see an empty engine bay. Before we put the engine in, we're going to take off the boot lid just to give us that little bit extra space when lifting the engine and gearbox into it. Then to get the engine high enough, we're going to be using the two post ramp. We're going to tie a strap around two of the engine mounts and then two of the posts on the ramp and then lifting it up like this. The same way we did the Mercial Argo. It's going to level out now. And then we're going to use the engine crane to pull up the gearbox and level it all out. Look at this, it's like David Blaine. One hovering Ferrari 430 engine. Magic. In comes the Ferrari and we're going to bring the car to the engine and gearbox. Then we can lower the ramp down being as steady as possible. Oh, it's so close. It's almost in. And bit by bit, being careful not to hit any of the bodywork or trap any of the wires, we got it in. Yeah! Ferrari engine in, start it up. <laughs> not quite yet. <laughs> not quite. No, not quite. Because although the engine's in, it's not held in by anything. Wish I had a mockingbird, I wish what we're trying to do now is the two lower engine mounts, just trying to get the bolts through it and line it up. It goes under here. And into the engine mount. Ooh. There's two engine mounts on the Ferrari and they're both at the bottom of it. One here and one here which I'm doing up right now. After that, there's two cables we need to connect. One which goes to the starter motor, which allows us to start the car, which goes just about here. And the other one, a ground wire for the engine, which connects to the bottom of the engine here. Ferrari oil filter, come on. Luckily, the oil filter is in a pretty accessible place. So it's nice and easy to get on. On. I could have done that. Boom. 
Next up is the fuel lines. There's two from each side. There's a tank there and there's a tank there. And you've got one fuel line here and one fuel line over here. And these go into the fuel rail where the injectors sit as well. Yeah, that's on. So that's both of the fuel rails on. And then we found something. We think we found the reason why the last gearbox was taken to bits or another clue to why. So not only does the gearbox hold gearbox oil, but the diff has separate uh, diff oil, which is controlled, well, it's filled up here. Then there's a separate pump here, but there's also on this pump, there is just here, there's something missing out of that. And we've later found the thing that's missing out of that is a pressure, is it a pressure, mm. a pressure switch for the, diff oil so the only reason why that would have been taken out is if it's failed or something along those lines and that's could have could have what's broken the diff you can see here the two oil lines which lead from that reservoir and go directly to the side of the differential here now if there was something wrong with the oil pressure or even something wrong with the pump and there wasn't any oil getting to the diff that's what could have caused the whole thing to fail hence why someone tried to take it apart and try and fix it. Luckily, the new pressure regulator has arrived so we can screw that into the diff. And also the pressure switch, which sits on the side of the diff has arrived as well. We just gotta hope everything actually works or we could be taking this thing apart again. Moving back to get the engine started, we need to plug in both the ECUs. One's in. There is two wiring looms, one for each side of the engine. And as there's two wiring looms, there's two ECUs. The oil tank has arrived, so this goes on the gearbox. Fill up the oil through the top here, and all the oil sits in the gearbox, goes down through the bottom of the gearbox without going actually in the gearbox, and the oil pump sucks it through into the engine. And once this is fitted, we should be able to put some oil into the car and start it. 75W90, gosh. First of all, in goes the gearbox oil. I probably could have started the car without this, but I didn't want to take any risks. After that, the separate reservoir for diff oil, which takes a special type of oil I had to order online. And I had no idea how much it took. Then I found out. <laughs> <laughs> After the gearbox oil and the diff oil, it's time finally for the engine oil. Do you want me to give you the battery and I'll pass it in or? No, shit. Shit. What we're going to try first is start it without the spark plugs or coils on. So there's no spark plugs there. That way we know it turns over and there's going to be no damage caused because there's no compression there because it's going to throw anything that's in the cylinder out of those spark plug holes. If that works, we're then going to see if we've got spark. If we get spark, we're going to put spark plugs in and then it's going to start fifth attempt. Fifth time. Anyone who turns the key first time on a rebuilt engine and turns over and it starts up first time is a, is a liar. I think he's got a magic touch. I think he can do it first time. <laughs> the battery doesn't go in there, does it? Well, that's where it was. Yeah. The battery just goes in the footwell? Yeah. Ah. And the fire extinguisher just behind it. We've got power, we've got power. It's connected. It's going up, it's going up three bars of fuel. Four bars, the fuel's going up. What? Full tank. Wait, no, it's gone down a bit. I know what you have to do. Open the door, close it. And then we get more, and then we get more fuel. <laughs> yeah. Full tank. Full tank. Oh no, now we're one more off full. This was it. We're about to turn the car over for the first time with no spark plugs in there. This should help up build oil pressure before we actually start it for real. But will it actually work? Go. Go. The engine sounded terrible. Again. Start. Very, very rattly. I don't like that. No. I've got no pressure here. No oil pressure. No. Not yet. That stinks. Yeah, the fuel's gonna come out, but that does not sound good. No, it just sounds like the bearings are shattering. I'm going again. 
it just wasn't building up oil pressure. It really wasn't looking good. But then, things changed. It sounded... Oh, it sounded better. Yeah, got pressure coming. Pressure coming, pressure coming. Four bar. Four bar. Oh. It started to run silent. Oh. Oil's getting round now, oil's getting round. Almost five bars. Yeah, no towering, no towering. That was good. Over five bars. That was good. Yeah, over five bars. How much damage did we do by doing that? Doing that because we couldn't have put any oil in the engine. So the engine was chattering there, which sounds like when you're off oh, fuel. The engine was chattering, which sounds like when you've got bad bearings, but that's because of no oil pressure getting there between the bearings. If it carried on like that, it probably would have died, but we put that lube in first, and as it got oil pressure, it seemed to have stopped, but that was scary. But dude, that sounded nasty, that did. It sounded like top end rattle. Yeah, yeah, when you do cams, the, the, the uh, hydraulic tappets, they've got all filled up with oil. Oh yeah, it's hydraulic tappets, isn't it? Yeah. On like the Mercy, which was shimmed. So, We've got oil in the engine now, and we've got fuel and all the other fluids. We know fuel's coming through because I can smell it. Yeah, so now we just need spark. This is where we find out whether we've plugged the right sensors into the right holes because we're going to see if we've got a spark now. What we need next is a spark to ignite the fuel going into the cylinder. So we're going to see if we've actually got a spark first. The good thing about this is the wiring is, the wiring is actually marked. You can see there, look, we've got number eight. So we know that this one goes to the eighth cylinder, unlike any of the other electrical connectors on this car. We've got a coil pack, we've got a spark plug on the end. So we're hoping now when we crank it, we should see a spark coming out of that. And I don't fancy touching it, if I'm perfectly honest. Yeah. yeah. Just a little bit, but it is. Yes. We've got a spark. We don't know whether it's sparking at the right time though. And we'll find that out in a minute when we put spark plugs in the old. So now we're putting spark plugs into all eight of the cylinders. And my dad's getting excited. We know we've got spark. We just don't know whether it's sparking at the right time yet. Coil, number eight, in position. Now we need seven. Look, we've got all them plugs in the right way around first time. The chance That's of those be plugs amazing. being in. Yeah, that, the chance of them all being right is very slim. Somebody will be looking looking down on it. If, if it's right, I did it. If it's right. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we're going from now on. If it's right, then it's my claim to fame. But if it's wrong, then we're going to blame my dad. <laughs> Just because we can. But now all the coils are going in the left hand side of the engine and my dad's put the coils in the right hand side of the engine. When we turn the key now, it should start. Just in case. That's optimistic that it's actually going to start. You are. Hannah's turning the key. Through no choice of my own. Are you actually ready? Yeah, yeah ready when you are. Okay, ready? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh! Why just my first time? Oh my <laughs> god, that <laughs> was. <laughs> it fired first time. <laughs> yeah. It fired first time! Right, well, <laughs> I think this is a short video now, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> Do you want to start it again? No, no, no. yeah, because I, yeah, yeah. I didn't think it was going to start! <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm going to stand a bit further back because I've got out. Yeah, yeah, annihilated. <laughs> there was just fumes and everything going back here. Yeah, there's a lot of energy there. Yeah, that, it must have just turned off it automatically. Oh, four cylinders. It was only running on four cylinders then. Oh. There was only firing out of this side. But, but, everyone witness, that was my side. <laughs> 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 that was my side that I put the plugs on. I put the injectors on that side, so. Did we check if there was a spark from this side? We didn't, did we? No, we didn't oh, check that no. side. But it fired, it fired out of this side when it first started up. 
I can't believe it started up first. I said, oh, anyone who says it starts up is rubbish, but we actually, that started up better than the Merchant Argo. Buzz yeah. in. So the Ferrari actually started, but then it only started to run on four cylinders on the left-hand side of the engine. So now we've got to figure out why. First thing we're going to check are the spark plugs on the right-hand side to see if they've got yeah. spark. Yeah, that's sparking. Yeah. Okay, okay, so we've got spark, so what are we missing? So we have got spark on the right hand side of the engine, but is it sparking at the right time? I'm going to go again and I'm going to give it some revs this time and see if that'll sort it, maybe. <laughs> it's like the Mercer. You can see by the excess of flames that it is sparking at the wrong time. So I went to go get the Autel to plug it into the OBD port to find out what was going wrong. Oh. Oh, it's not an OBD. So it looks like the Ferrari requires some special plug, not an OBD2. So we can't see what the ECU is telling us to... Well, we can't see what the ECU wants to tell us on why that bank is not firing or not firing correctly. So I think we're going to have to figure it out the old school way and just like plug stuff in and unplug it. But then we found something. Yeah, so these, these are like the cam <clears throat> sensors and these will be telling the whole car when the cams lobes are opening or closing the exhaust or the inlet. And if I've got these plugged in wrong, it could mess it up. Maybe we'll try and plug them in the other way around, but there's no way of knowing because the loom isn't marked up. So this is going to be very, well, we don't know. Could work, might not work. This was Tony's side, so it could be wrong. It, I know, that's the thing. I, like... <laughs> <laughs> so my dad's now going to switch over the cam plugs and just see if that makes any difference to the running of it. Here we go. Ready? Instantly, it was better. It was running on all eight cylinders. Oh, I did that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That ran way better. Still flaming out there. I forgot, probably shouldn't rev an engine when we've just rebuilt it, but <laughs> got excited. That ran way better, and the throttle was doing what I want. I think goal one is to get this car running to temperature so we know it actually runs to temperature. And we can't do that without coolant, and all these coolant lines aren't connected. So we're going to connect them up first, then go from there, I think. Then we'll try the gearbox. Now, like most supercars, things aren't always straightforward. With the engine being right at the back and the radiators being right at the front of the car, the coolant has to run a really long distance between the radiator and the engine. First off, we're making sure that all the coolant hoses are connected. Then we move on to the tricky part, filling it. All the coolant lines are on and now we've got the coolant tank. There is a big like brace which this all sits on, but we're not going to put that on yet because we've got to do the gearbox later on. And big coolant line on the bottom. And then there's two more coolant lines to the top of the coolant reservoir. Instead of putting the bar in, just to run it up to temperature, we want to avoid putting more stuff on because if something's wrong, we've got to take it all off. Yeah? Boom. Now this is where it's a little tricky. We can't just pour in new coolant. We have to vacuum fill it. I have to put this device in the coolant tank and then connect the air line to blow air across this vacuum filler. And with the air blowing across it, it will then pull a vacuum in the hole of the cooling system. Hopefully this makes sense. Now that should hold vacuum. If there's no leaks in the system, it should hold vacuum. Let's wait. Great news. It's held vacuum lock, held in exactly the same spot. That must mean we should have no leaks, but I have said it now. 
Now, I'm gonna use the vacuum filler to vacuum fill the coolant. I don't know why I'm speaking like that. <laughs> so at the minute, there should be no air in the cooling system because we sucked it all out. And we know there's no leaks in the system because the vacuum has held. After that, I connect up this part to the vacuum filler and put the pipe in a bottle of coolant. And using the vacuum that we've pulled, it's now gonna suck all the coolant out of the coolant bottle and into the Ferrari. By pulling the vacuum, this should stop us getting any air locks in the system. Right, will the car run to temperature or is it gonna smoke like anything because the head gasket's gone or something like that? Why does it set its own alarm off starting off? <laughs> the coolant needed a little top up before we attempt again to try and run it to temperature. Going for it. On the good side, the Ferrari starts up and runs the first time. The thing is, it is so loud with no exhaust. And if we were going to run this car to temperature, we were going to have to put up with this noise for a long time. But that wasn't our problem at the minute. Sounds terrible. Yeah, it's just missing a bit or, or it's on a... Yeah, there's a couple of cylinders which ain't far in there. So now the Ferrari started to misfire. So we need to find out exactly what's going on with it. Uh, in the last video, we looked for the OBD port and we've seen at the back here we thought this was the OBD, but this isn't the OBD. Scott Ratarossa says there should be an OBD port underneath here somewhere. And he's right. So maybe we can plug it in and we can see what the car's saying, but it's decided to run on only probably five cylinders at the minute. Let's go plug it in. After I plugged the code reader in, it was showing so many faults. But there is still a lot of stuff to go onto the engine. So instead of messing around, I made the executive decision to just start putting the rest of the engine back together. There's a lot of sensors and wiring on this car and leaving just one thing unplugged could cause it to run how it was running. So I just want to make sure I cover everything off before we start jumping to conclusions because we need to get the car running right before we can run the car to temperature. Another thing that I'm about to do is connect up the drive shafts as we're gonna find out whether the gearbox that we rebuilt is in neutral as it should be. But the eagle eye viewers would have seen when we started it earlier that the gearbox was actually spinning even though it should be in neutral, which isn't the best of news. But I guess we'll find out when we start the car up again. This should save our ears so we can run the car to temperature without being deafened. Inside here, inside here is a Capristo exhaust system to match the Capristo uh, manifold that we've got, the four to one manifold. And we've got sports caps by the looks of it. I just really hope we've got everything to fit this exhaust on. Now, this should sound absolutely unreal and not definite on idle. Massive thanks to Scuderia Parts for sending this out and they've helped massively throughout this whole build. Now they're gonna help us not be deaf. This exhaust system looks amazing. Let's just hope it sounds amazing. Now Scuderia Parts are the UK exclusive dealers for Capriso and Novitec. So if you fancied one yourself, check the link out in the description for some good offers. For now, I've got to fit the Capristo to my Ferrari. The sports cats went on first, connecting them to each manifold. Then it's the back box. And this fits to the car like no other exhaust system I've ever fitted. The exhaust tips with the pipes connected to them go up and under and connect to the back box. And the back box is being held to the car by the rear crash bar. Really strange, but I guess it works. And the Ferrari is coming together nicely now. In goes the lavender sensors. Yep, 
Not quite lavender sensors, but these O2 sensors could be part of the issue why the car's idling bad. This car has four O2 sensors, one before each catalytic converter and one after each catalytic converter. And if the car isn't getting a reading from them, it would probably cause it to run rough. Now we're just gonna put this in for now to hold the coolant tank because it's like a jigsaw puzzle, this car. One thing holds another thing, another thing holds another thing. Inside here are the air filters. Oh, one thing I've thought about before we start it, I have connected the drive shafts up. So that gearbox that we rebuilt, if it's actually stuck in gear, I probably should raise it up in the ramp before I start <laughs> it, shouldn't I, in case it jumps up. There we are. If the wheels spin, it's not good. <laughs> here we go. Check, okay. I think this car is actually pretty okay. And if you look on here, the mileage is only 32,000 miles. So it's quite a low mileage. And as long as we get this gearbox working, it is a genuine gated manual Ferrari F430. So really it should hold its value pretty well. And I can back all this up with a car vertical check. Let's start it. The wheels are spinning and they shouldn't be. My dad's just told me to put my foot on the brake and if the car's in gear, it's gonna end up stalling the engine. Let's see what it does. Whoa! And it was all good. The gearbox was in neutral. So it must just be a bit of gearbox drag causing the wheels to spin. <laughs> For a V8. Yeah, it's, it doesn't sound like a V8, does it? That sounds sweet. Italian orchestra. It just doesn't like idling very well, does it? Well, your vacuum part's dropping, it. Eh? Yeah, that's what it is. The, vac the vacuum part's causing it to idle. The exhaust sounds mental. For a V8, it sounds like a V12. It's like wham, wham. It's well high pitched. Yeah. What do you think? Wicked. Yes, he loves the Ferrari. Dab on the haters. <laughs> <laughs> Dab on the haters. <laughs> what does that mean? <laughs> now the Ferrari has a kind of complex vacuum system. And that's what we think is causing the lumpy idle issue. Because we haven't connected any of it. This is an on and off solenoid valve. And this solenoid valve plugs into this electrical connector here and then some vacuum lines run to it. We assume this is in charge of turning on and off some sort of vacuum, which could be vital for getting the F430 to idle. There's then loads more vacuum lines that we need to connect up and these ones at the back that we need to plug up because those vacuum lines were used for the old exhaust valves to open and close them, which we don't have anymore. Onto the last few vacuum lines, then we're gonna see if we can get a good idle. Let's run it. Let's see if it runs sweet. That's loads better. That sounds... Oh. oh. <laughs> Spoke too soon. That sounds loads better. Dude, that's humming now. So the vacuum system seems to have fixed the idling issue. Now we can let it run to temperature. See, we're getting up to temperature. Now, I haven't got the throttle. So, since we've done that, I now don't have, I now, like, put my foot on the throttle. And it's like not, it's like suffocating. Before, it, le it let me rev it, but now it's like, it feels like there's some kind of restriction when revving the car. But then something bad happened. Ooh. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh no. Is that why we're letting me revving it? Because we're because no. we've got too much drag on the gearbox. Oh no. It seems like the car jumped into gear for no reason. Well there goes again. You're yeah, drip. I think you're going to drip out of the rocker cover. Your rocker cover's leaking away. Oh. And to add insult to injury, we developed a small oil leak which was dripping from the rocker cover onto the exhaust manifold. So we've got a leak out of the rocker cover and it's dragging in, like, oh, we think it was in neutral, but 
I couldn't work out why it wasn't revving. It's got oil in the gearbox, isn't it? Yeah, we've got that Edith light. But I, I was trying to rev it, and it was like really difficult to rev to rev it. But we've never revved it since the wheels have been on the floor. Sorry, I can't see like the smoke coming off the rocker cover leak. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the plan. I'm going to put the car in the air. Car's in the air. Now I'm going to start it. The wheels might spin because they normally do spin in neutral, but if I can put my foot on the brake and then accelerate and the engine stalls, we know there's a big problem. <laughs> I don't want to know the answer. <laughs> So what the hell caused the Ferrari to go into gear? And why is it not in gear now? It is really mind boggling us. I just don't get why, why I was revving it and then the car moved. Look, none of this is connected. Like you can't, this, this can't be in gear. So why did it move and then stall? Back on again and see if that helped. That's better. Yeah. Sounds nice. Any wheels spinning? No. Oh, it's getting hot. The cooling temperature's getting way too high. So that seems to be fixed, and the car did run to temperature, but the problem is, it overheated. It looks like we've got an airlock in the cooling system. What solved it on the Porsche was running it with that cap open. So it was gonna start it, run it without the cap off, and hopefully it'll burp out any air it has in the system. But this didn't work. I don't mm. think it's going around the engine, is it? Well, it's all on the floor now. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Why is it not going to the, the fan zone even came on? Because I don't think the stat's opening, is it? No. The thermostat opens, lets the coolant go down through to the radiators, which explains why we didn't have coolant on them in the first place. And then when the coolant can go through to the radiators, the fans can go on, cool the coolant down, and we won't get boiling coolant over like that. So maybe we've got a bad thermostat. We didn't put a brand new one in. Well, not working. <laughs> where, where is the yeah. thermostat? The thermostat is at the bottom of the engine. Ah. So we when... It, we could run it without the thermostat in. Yeah, we take it off. That's, so I was about to say, I had a problem like this with my MG when I was 16, and you take the thermostat off, let it run through and see if it still runs cool. Yeah. Oh, what? Because MGs used to blow head gaskets all the time. Yeah. yeah. Which yeah. is probably what this is going to do if it carries on this way. <laughs> <laughs> Inside most engines, there's a thermostat. When the coolant gets up to temperature, the thermostat will open and allow the coolant to go to the radiators where the coolant will be cooled down and then the coolant will go back through the engine, keeping it nice and cool. We think the thermostat in the Ferrari might be stuck closed, meaning the coolant will never get cooled down. So what we're going to do is take the thermostat out and run it without one. How does it work, Tony? Right, well, it has wax in it. Bit of fine, man. And when it gets up to a certain temperature, the wax melts, obviously. And then the spring is allowed to push. It looks seized up like that. Oh, look, that's the wax. Oh, yeah. So it's you leaking. See it? It's leaked out. 
That makes sense why it's not working. So the wax has completely left the thermostat, meaning it would be stuck closed. So what we're gonna do now is pop back in the thermostat housing without the thermostat in it. This just means it will take longer to run the car up to temperature. Why didn't you just put in a new thermostat when you built the engine, you dingbat? There's a lot of things that we didn't put new in the engine and the thermostat, because we had one, we just thought we'd put it in. And it's very cheap and it's easy to replace, so shut. Oh, please. He told me to shut up. So in goes the empty thermostat housing. This is what they actually do on the race cars. So I can't see it being an issue just for us to test whether the coolant's actually going to go to the front of the car now. Oh, I'm in. Sweet. Right. We should be able to run it to temperature now. Let's put some more coolant in it. Liam, it's your job to assess any, um, assess any leakages. Okay. okay, I'm on it for you. There's leak in there. So we're at 70, 80 degrees. Normal temperature for cooling is about 90. So when it gets to about 90, we should hear the fans tick in and keep it cool. If we have, if it does that, winner. So the bottom radiator hose is hot, but the top of the radiator hose is cold. So I feel like there's an airlock somewhere. This is exactly like the Porsche. A nightmare. Call it at the back, radiators at the front. Nightmare. It didn't work. And we tried everything after that. We took a radiator hose off at the front and ran the engine to see if the coolant would come through. If we can run it with that little hose off and let the coolant come through, we might be able to get rid of the airlock, maybe. But it didn't. We ran the car with the coolant cap off to see if it would burp out any air bubbles, but that just caused a mess. We then tried to jack up the back of the Ferrari. If we can get it as high as we can, all the air's gonna raise to the top, so we're just gonna give this a go now. But that didn't work. We then drained all the coolant and vacuum filled it up again, but none of this worked at all. Okay. That is just not playing ball. We need to come back to it because also we have a problem with the gearbox. Let's start with, let's start with problem number one, the gearbox. Let's do it. That's problem number one. <laughs> <laughs> There's supposed to be a pump attached to the pedal. So when you push the pedal down, it sends hydraulic fluid all the way down to the clutch, releases the clutch. That's been taken off for some reason, but somehow I've managed to grab one. When you press the clutch pedal down, it should push fluid down here and to your clutch. This is the first thing to go on. This is the clutch pump which connects to the pedal. And God knows why I didn't have one on this Ferrari. As there's next to no manual F430s in the UK. This just bolts to the firewall, just like this. And then I've got to connect the hose from the brake reservoir to the clutch pump. This reservoir here is the brake reservoir. That's got dot four in it and the clutch uses the same fluid. Now the hose is connected from the brake reservoir to the clutch pump. I've now got to connect this clutch line which will allow the fluid to go from the clutch pump down to the release bearing. After I've done that, I go inside the car and connect the clutch pump to the clutch pedal. It's a pretty fiddly job and especially hard to film it as well. But now the clutch pedal is connected to the pump. Good progress so far. So after you press the clutch, the fluid runs down the line all the way to this point here. Now, because this is a manual, we're gonna need a pipe to push the release bearing to, to release the clutch. Whereas on an automatic, you won't have that. So this pipe, is like gold dust. We couldn't find it anywhere, so we had to have one made. Here's the made pipe. We've had this made. Thank you. Up here, onto that. And you can see it goes down through there and pushes the release, be release bearing, which is good. And then it goes onto this, right here. Again, air is our worst nightmare tonight. 
we have literally now got to tighten this up, put some dot four fluid in it and bleed the system. So we're gonna undo this bleed nipple there and push out all the air out of the system. Then we should get a clutch. Right, Liam's gonna pump the clutch. When Liam's pumping the clutch, it's gonna push that fluid all the way down to the back now. So we just gotta make sure it stays topped up as we're gonna get a lot of air in it. Just keep pumping it. You did a good job there. Now the fluid is topped up in the brake reservoir, we can lift the car up and begin to bleed the clutch system. Oh no. Yeah, stop. Uh, is it just leaking off of that? Is it not? Does that pipe not work? Pipe's fine. What's happened then? Oh. Oh, is that just coming straight out? Oh yeah, it is. It's coming from oh, the gearbox. Oh no. It looks like the fluid is leaking from the gearbox somewhere. This is not good. I have just done. And if it's coming from the release bearing, we've got to take the gearbox off to fix it. Ah, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. But we've dodged a bullet here because it looks like it's just leaking from these connections, which we can actually get our spanner on to. They were loose, they were loose. Oh, thank God that's an easy fix. <laughs> we, might be, we might be okay. Oh, that was loose. Who put the release bearing on? Um, I think that was your dad. Clip back. My dad. Getting blamed. He's not here, so we'll just blame him. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just check this out. Press the... Uh, look at that, doing the release bearing. That's brilliant. Okay, now what we need to do is bleed it. So... Liam was pumping the clutch, which was pushing the fluid through the clutch system. And whilst he was doing that, I was cracking open the bleed nipple to let out all the air. Until finally we can get a half-decent clutch pedal. I think we've got a clutch pedal. The next thing is to select the gears, see if we've got any gears. But to do that, these are the gear cables, which when you are shifting the shifter inside, it's gonna move up and down and left to right. The thing is with this, these require loads of brackets to be on the side of the gearbox to hold these gear cables in place. And without them, we, we literally can't connect them to the gear shifter, which is over here. And the gear shifter, which to select it in gear, this goes, like up and down, left and right, in and out. And we can't do that without these parts. And these parts are so hard to find. And we have actually ordered them, but they, it's going to be at least another month until they arrive, which is so annoying. So I think what we can do to see if it goes in gear is manually just put this into a random gear. I don't know what gear we're going in. We're just going to slide this shifter forward or backwards and try and put it in a gear. And if it does go in gear, we can see if the clutch is working by putting the clutch down. And if the clutch goes down and the wheels don't spin, we know the clutch is working. And if we lift the clutch up and the wheels start to spin, we know it goes in gear. So that's what we're aiming for. So I'm going to try and get it in gear now. If it's in sit, will it just stall? No, not if there's no, not on the, nothing in the ramp. No. Right. Going down a bit. Okay. Oh, there we are. I think we're in a gear there. That looks like it's in a gear. I think we've gone in a gear. I don't know what gear could be reverse. This is the moment where we find out whether a gearbox has got some sort of hope. Some sort of hope whether we've rebuilt it right. If I start now with the foot on the clutch, it shouldn't spin the wheels. Right. Foot on the brake as well. I can drive out of here at least. <laughs> Not come back in. <laughs> okay, we've, got, we've actually got reverse. You actually built a gearbox. I built a reverse gearbox. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah! Yeah! A gearbox works! Yes! Should we try another gear? We can try. Let's try another gear. Let's try another gear. No, it's alright. It's smooth. Oh. There we go. That's in a gear. That's in a gear. 
That's it. Is it reverse? I'm in gear. No, no it's not reverse because I've gone back. Oh, yeah, it looks different, different to reverse. Awesome. Any movement? Yeah. Oh, we're good, we're good. Clutch coming up. And we're going forward. Yeah, look how fast it's going. Yeah, go on, all the way. Let's hope you don't rattle and come off. Yo, that's working. That's actually working. Look, foot off the clutch. Watch my speedo. I'm busy! 60 mile an hour. It's like you're on the dyno. <laughs> 60 mile an hour just did. Turn off. Okay, okay. I don't know whether this is successful or unsuccessful, but it's been eventful and we've made progress, although it's only been short. Cold start, it should start up. Cold start is the only start we can do because anything over cold, it overheats. First time. I think maybe what we should do is first thing is see if the water pump is actually pumping water through the system because if it's not, there's our issue. If it is pumping through, we surely have an airlock somewhere, but could that just be safe? I think we should take off one of these pipes, then we see if water's coming out. So I'm getting fans in the car, I'm getting heat in the car, which says to me the coolant is circulating. So has it just got an airlock? I don't know. Let's see if it runs the temperature now. For the blowers in the car to get hot, warm coolant has to circulate through the cooling system and into the heater core. The engine's right at the back on this Ferrari, and of course the heater core is inside the car. Therefore, the water pump must be working because the coolant must be circulating from the back of the car and through into the heater core, which is why the fans are warm. So it seems our problem lies elsewhere. The Ferrari's now run up to temperature, so we should hear the coolant fans kick in to keep it running at the exact temperature it's hot air one coolant fan has started to work which is good news now we need to see if the coolant holds that temperature and doesn't get any hotter right it's just crept over 100 degrees if that temperature goes down we're onto a winner if it keeps rising we have a problem has that one come on yet no have we ever had this one on? I don't on? think that one come on. I think that side came on, but that side didn't. But it kept rising. Only one fan seems to be working. Way too hot. It's at 120 degrees. What I found out through my research is that this fan is supposed to come on at a certain temperature. And then if that temperature doesn't decrease, then it activates the right hand fan. N no, don't know what logic that actually means. So the question is whether this fan even work so i think the first step we're going to do is just put power directly to the right hand fan and there's two relays here that's for the left hand fan and that's for the right hand fan i think so if we pull the relay out and then uh that's going to put power to it and then we'll see if it comes on i would assume that the two big terminals are the power to the fan and that's just the relay clicking. So my dad's gonna bridge the power using this wire, effectively canceling out the relay's job. That's one on. And the fan turned on. This one. Oh, okay, so the relay's the other way around. That's what I said. So that's, that, that's, the, fan, but that's the fan we know works. And now he's gonna do the same for the other one. I won't put that in yet. There you go. Hey! It works. Wait. It sounds a bit sketchy, but using my big brain does that mean this is what the problem is it could mean that's what the problem is but but we've done some research before you got here all oh, right okay and we already switched the relays over and that fan still comes on with the other relay with the other relay so the relay is good now i'm confused to turn that fan on it requires the coolant temperature sensor to turn that on. So when it gets to a certain temperature, which we know is working because the dashboard, it reads a certain temperature, it activates that fan. But when it reaches a further temperature, it needs something else 
not a temperature sensor, but a temperature switch, which is just down here, like this switch right here. So there's a coolant temperature sensor, that, and that is the switch. All the switch does really is ground a circuit out. When one fan isn't cooling the coolant enough, the temperature of the coolant will pull down this disc here, pulling down the terminal to then create a full circuit which should turn on the other fan. To test this theory out, I've just disconnected the electrical connection and my dad is going to bridge the terminals together with his wire to see if the other fan comes on. Yes, the fan is turning on. Both fans are on, so both fans work, the relay works, so the weakest link here, we think, is that switch. So I'm straight on to order a switch which was £78 plus tax, and it should be here tomorrow. But in the meantime, we've got a thermostat to change. The thermostat housing and the thermostat are directly after the water pump on this engine. And at the minute, there's not one in there because ours was faulty. All it essentially does is stop the coolant flow going to the radiators to cool the coolant down when the car's trying to warm up. But then when the car gets to temperature, the thermostat opens, letting the coolant flow through the radiators and stay at the right temperature. Here's the new thermostat housing with the thermostat on. And one thing I've realized after watching this video, I've put a bit of gasket seal around it but i've somehow completely missed off the seal but we'll see if it leaks after we put coolant in thermostat housing is in we're still waiting for the temperature switch but one thing else we can do whilst we're waiting is these gear linkage aren't connected to anything we've rebuilt the engine we've rebuilt the gearbox but we don't know whether the gearbox even works yet we can put it into gear because we can move this around and get it into gear which is what we did in the last video, but we don't know whether, we don't know what gear it's going in, we don't know whether it works, we don't know if we can select gears. All we need is the stuff to hold these cables onto the gearbox and so we can move them all around and connect it inside. Issue is with that, apparently according to Google, only 1500 manual F430s were ever made. So finding all the manual mechanism, like the little arms and stuff like that, was an absolute mission and all of this, is to build up the mechanism in the gearbox. Me and Liam are gonna build all this up. I can't really explain how this works. We're probably gonna get it wrong. Let's just do it. Now there's lots of arms and there's lots of bearings to make this work. And all we've got is this diagram to put it all together. So we're hoping with a little bit of common sense and mostly winging it, we should be able to work out where all of this stuff goes. It's just like building Lego. All of these arms mount to the side of the gearbox and need to be able to swivel and move around when you move the gear shifter in the car which will pull the cables either left, right or up and down. I have to do a shout out to EAG USA for this part here which mounts the cables to the side of the gearbox because they're no longer available from Ferrari. And this part is actually from a manual conversion kit which Freddy has used, aka Tavares, on his 430 Scuderia. And I think we've just about sussed it out. We've got it on! But we're not sure whether it's correct. We are not sure whether this is correct. But we're gonna find out. Stage one is seeing whether it will go into gear with the car not on. Stage two is finding out whether it will go into gear with the car on. And stage three is actually moving it and driving it. Stage one, start. Right. In, in, in my opinion, this does not look right. It doesn't look right. Oh! Oh! Oh, it did some it. It did some it. It's really floppy. It's, it's an old car, Matt. You can't just it forever. Yep. Something definitely didn't feel right with it. That second. Something ain't right there. So I was going to have to strip it apart to see if there was anything wrong. Because all this was taken apart when we got the car. So I'm just having a look, see if they've taken anything under here, which... Oh. Oh. I think only one cable's connected. Oh, there's something broken. Liam, explain it in your best possible way best what's possible broken. Way is there's something that's broken that, that, that's there. Off the side, like, yeah. Dead flopper. So, and that cable there is the forward and back cable, this yeah. one at the, at the bottom. So show that in, a, Look, in action. Can you see that? 
I can see that, Liam. Does that mean it's yeah. only going into third and fourth? Absolutely right going into third it's, and fourth. Yeah, potentially. Yeah. Mm. But then the other cable... So that's your sideway. Down there. Yeah. And this is sideways. But Hat. this bit snapped. Yeah. So when you do this, it's not doing anything. But if you really launch it, look. Is that first thing? That takes it down. And But now this is popped that. out, so we can't get third so or can't fourth. Go side. So we need this part here, which I know is going to be very, 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 very difficult to find. Right. So let's see if it goes in third and fourth. Yeah, do you want me to send you up? Yeah, send me up a bit and we'll see if it goes in third and fourth. Ready? Third gear. So, problem is that. So let's see if we can find one for sale. Good luck. Yeah, who the hell is going to be selling one of them? Granddad's got one. Has he? No. <laughs> He's silly, isn't he? <laughs> we found one. It is strangely still available from Ferrara, but at a price. £320 plus tax. So we're going to have to wait for that to arrive. In the meantime, the fan switch has arrived, so I can start to fit this, and then we can see if we can get the car running to temperature. It's got to work this time. It's got to run to temperature, and we're all good. If it doesn't work, could it be that little red box thing? Red box thing? That was plugged in on the side of the... Red box? You know the little red box things that were plugged into the side of the thing? <laughs> <laughs> The relays. Yeah, yeah, look, we're good. Now it's just a case of waiting for the Ferrari to run to temperature. And when it did get to temperature, we're hoping it stayed there. And the fans came on. I like the Ferrari. We're hoping now that once the left side fan turns on, after a while, it activates the right side fan. Come on, fans. Oh, yeah. Both this cool. one's on. No, this, this one's on. Is this one on? Oh, yeah, it's on. They're both on. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it should stay at temperature now, then. Both fans were working. And with both of them working, it should keep the car at the right temperature. It's at 90 degrees. Bang on. Say you look temperature. Yeah. yeah. It actually worked. So now we can start making this Ferrari look like a Ferrari. Welcome to my bumper shop. This has been freshly painted already. Uh, the car will be all detailed and matched, but this has all been painted by the body shop. Cheers, body shop. We've just got to complete it all with all this kit. The front splitter in that, which goes on here. How much was that again? It was expensive, wasn't it? It was like 500 pounds. Like 500 pounds. quid, yeah. Nuts. For that. It's like fiber glass. So I got to work with attaching the expensive splitters and all of the other parts which make up the F430 front bumper, like the front grills. And also the grills on the side as well. Whilst my dad got to work with putting the wiper linkage in, which we had to buy brand new second hand, and all the scuttle panels around the bonnet. And it was finally time to add the bumper. This is the first time I've seen it with a complete bumper on. Oh, the Ferrari's a good looking car, isn't it? The F430. It is, that is looking nice. And what we've done is, is black. These are normally grey. But anything grey is going black because I feel like it gives it more depth. Ah. Again, like the Mercia Largo, the bolts slide through the inside of the tub and then you have to add a nut on them. Then we can slot in the carpet to finish the tub up. Satisfaction for me now. There ain't no satisfaction. And would you look at that for a first fitment? It's looking pretty damn good. Now, let's head to the back. 
onto the rear bumper. Now this one is OEM and it's also been painted in, I think it's called Resale Red actually. Now you know These heat shields bolt onto both sides, I assume to stop the bumper from melting. Then the top grille will also bolt onto the bumper. All of this I've had to order. And as you've guessed, and a lot of you are probably right on this, we've gone way over budget already. But I do think these manuals F430s will climb in price over the years. So all is not that bad. Wow! This bumper doesn't actually bolt straight to it. These are genuine Ferrari spacers because the stock bumper doesn't fit and they all come in different sizes. Um, like here's a thin one, here's a fat one. And these go like that. And then just space it out. Nice to know. That is so Italian. Again, just like the Mercia Largo, the rear bumper uses spacers. But that's the quirk of these older Italian cars, and that's the kind of thing I like about them. They're kind of like a glorified kit car. But don't tell Ferrari I said that. Just the last couple of bolts now for the rear bumper, and then I can move onto the rear diffuser making an almost complete rear end. As some of you may notice, I am missing a few reflectors and registration plate lights, but they're on order. I tell you what, this is a good looking car. Every single piece I put on now is making a drastic improvement. And what once was, to me, felt like kind of an impossible build is slowly Kind of feeling possible. But if you also said to me, Matt, the bumpers look a different shade of red to the rest of the car, then I kind of would have to agree with you. But remember, this paint is like a month old and this paint is like 18 years old. So I think maybe with like a good paint correction, we could probably get it pretty similar. Or I think afterwards, anyway, I've got to drop it down to the body shop, Allied Automotive, to touch up loads of little things on this car anyway. So maybe we just match it all in to get it absolutely perfect. But now, this Ferrari is really coming together. And to say neither me or my dad had any experience with Ferraris before this actually makes me really proud. It's just a huge achievement even to get this far. I guess hard work really does beat talent. And if this car actually runs and drives, it goes to prove it. There is still loads of engine covers and everything missing on here, which we'll get to, but we're not finally finished yet. But I did say, I think I said at the start of this video, I was gonna drive it. And I wanna to keep to that promise. So, well, here goes nothing. You can only get third gear. Yeah, I'm going for third gear. <laughs> <laughs> so here goes nothing. It's not exactly finished, but I think it might be good enough just to roll it out in third gear. Some of you might notice it's still got odd wheels on. The paint isn't great, there's no seats in it, but none of this is gonna stop me from trying to drive it for the first time. Yeah, that'll do. Stop. Right. This is my first drive. Third gear. <laughs> <laughs> Can't be seen. Let's do it. She sounds good. I don't know what his plan is now because he's literally gone down a straight with no way to turn around. It's reversing, what? <laughs> we got reversed! <laughs> The clutch feels good. It drove well. I mean, it pulled up in the fair. That's a sign of a good clutch. Well, we built the gearbox, built the engine, and it, it went in a straight line. Now, we're going to attempt to try and get it into first gear. So, straight, straight forward. Is that it? That's not it, that's not it. Go on. 
might, we might, it, it might be too far. And not, not, not left, not left, you're going to trap my finger. Are you trying to make me You've do? just got to go forward, don't do any left business. Yes, <gasps> that could be first gear. That could actually be first gear. It is! <laughs> God, that sounds nuts. What the? It was well fast. Oh my God. I hit my back. It was well fast. It actually works. How have you put together a gearbox that works? <laughs> I'm <laughs> impressed. <laughs> it literally was just, it was wheel spinning. Yeah, that. that sounded nuts from behind that as well. That sounded sick. What do you think of the Ferrari? I think it's great and I love it. Well, it actually, well, it kind of works. The main reason we couldn't really drive it is because this is limp. But we're gonna make it stiff again because this little situation we got here, you see that's broken. So we can actually go backwards and forward into gear, third and fourth, but to move to the side, it doesn't really do it. The part that's broken, we've managed to order it, 380 pound. No wonder it's broken because it's made out of plastic. Someone definitely could have 3D printed that for us, but 370 pounds, if you can 3D print that, you would have made 370 pounds. The bit you can see is broken in the middle here, holds the gear stick in place in the middle, and without it, it's completely loose. The gearbox uses two cables to change gear, one cable to go forward and backwards, and the other one to go side to side. The gear stick won't go side to side because it just falls out of place. So to access this part and change it, I've got to completely dismantle the centre console. Never done this before, couldn't I? I can see it sort of had a locking nut and then a threaded part on the back of the gear stick. So I'd undo that first, then unscrew this threaded part. Then after that, there was a C-clip on the side of the gear stick. I had to take out the C-clip, which then had a bunch of washers, a spring, which keeps the gear stick in the central position, and loads more tiny little components but I still couldn't get the plastic out. I've removed something from the side, something from the front, and last thing to be removed is this thing from the back. Flame! But it was pretty seized in there. Oh. Everything's fine. Yeah, 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 yeah! What were you? What? It's hot down there. But eventually, we got it out. Yeah! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> After that, we had to pull the gear stick so it disconnected from the cable below it. And once we got the gear stick out, I realized something else wasn't right. When I put the gear stick into the new plastic piece, it was still sitting loose in there. And my dad noticed there was something else broken, which sits on the bottom of this spring here. You can see on this diagram, we're missing number six. Another tiny part. The part. We've got one and we've got an upgraded one in aluminium and it's coming tomorrow. Fingers crossed it will be here. So now we can crack on with something else and hopefully this is gonna solve it. If it doesn't, we're in a big problem, but I think it will. We're going to put the battery in. The one there, that see that says Ferrari on it? Because that's for the Ferrari. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. <laughs> here is the battery cover, but I think I've made a vast, very, Oh no. I made an error. Tell me what mistake has he made. <laughs> what mistake has he made? <laughs> can you not tell? <laughs> <laughs> I think he painted that black. <laughs> I, I know. I bought it black. Completely forgot the carpet's red. Well, it will be red when we clean it. So my dad got on with putting in the battery cover. Without any idea, he would actually own this car soon. So maybe I need to get some fabric paint for that black carpet to make it match. After that, there's more trims to go on the back of the Ferrari. These black things sit behind the grille and almost stop you from seeing inside the engine bay when you're behind the car. It just neaten things up a little bit. There's one for each side, and that's looking a lot better. Wow, that was, whoa. Well, oh yeah, that's such a quad now. Yeah, it looks better. It's not all blacked out. What do you think? Oh, that looks so much better. There's also a few things missing from this rear bumper, as you can see. Reflectors and some registration plate lighting under here. I didn't realize I was missing any of this when I built up the bumper. As if I had it before, it would have been a lot easier to install with the bumper off. This is the wiring loom for the, the registration plate lights. I assume that these clip onto that, like that. Like, you know, like, boom, boom, like that. You know, like that. And then the registration plate light loom clips into the engine loom at the back here. Then all I've got to do is slide the wires through this tiny little hole in the bumper 
which then would come out where the registration plate lights are. Do you reckon it matters which way I plug these? No. Each connector goes onto the side of the light and then we're going to test it. It works. Doesn't matter which way it goes round. And now that we know it works, we can bolt them into the bumper for good. And that is the rear bumper complete. Rear bumper is all put together now and is complete, which is good. But there's still some more things we need to fix and eventually modify and improve as well. And that requires the cars to go in the air for the next thing that's actually missing. We have an ABS fault on the dash. So when you're driving it, the brakes are going on and off, on and off, on and off because it thinks it's skidding. And the reason of that is because there's a wheel, sp that's loose. A wheel speed sensor, which is loose on that side, and no wheel speed sensor on this side. There's supposed to be one there. I have ordered one, it was about 40 quid. Uh, it's off a Maserati, but same thing. That's meant to go there. What I didn't realize and completely forgot is that there's some kind of modified made bracket which mounts this too. So we haven't got that bracket. It doesn't look anything special probably from a million pound from Ferrari. So we're just gonna take that off and make the same bracket that side and hopefully that works. Fingers crossed. Right, so you've got to replicate that, but a mirror image for that side. Mirror image? Yeah. Yeah, well it'll just be the same, the same. But mirrored. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Curveball. That ain't an ABS sensor. That's completely thrown me off now then. So that is a suspension control module. I don't exactly know how it works or what it does, but I know I'm missing one. So whether this is linked to the ABS in some way, I have no idea. But this Ferrari has some kind of special suspension which can adjust depending on what driving mode you're in. What these sensors have got to do with that, I have absolutely no idea. Right, before we find out whether we have any warning lights on the dash anymore, which hopefully we won't, but we don't know. I have noticed that this car still sits kind of high. It has got the stock wheels on, which we will be changing in this video, but I just expected it to sit a little bit lower. But luckily, these are on adjustable coilovers from standard, so we could just wind these down a bit and it should hopefully make it sit a little bit lower, look a little bit nicer. So that's what we're gonna do now. And we're just gonna guess exactly where we want it to go. I'm sure you guys all know how coilovers work. I've noticed they come standard on a lot of high-end supercars. And this is good because we can adjust the ride height without having to buy expensive aftermarket suspension. All I've got to do is twist the suspension down to a ride height I think is going to work. Again, this is going to be complete guesswork and I won't know how low it's going to be until we put the wheels on and lower it down to the floor. Another job that needs doing are the handbrake brake pads. There's a separate caliper here, which is just for the handbrake. And whilst the brake pads look good in the actual brakes, the handbrake caliper brake pads don't look the best. So my dad's knocking out the pin here, then unscrewing the top bolt of the handbrake caliper. Unfortunately, you can't get to the bottom one because the lower arm's in the way, but just by undoing the top bolt, it can slide the brake pads out on one side and on the other side. Then he's got to take off the actual brake caliper which he's doing now, so he can remove the brake disc, which looks a little rusty, but he's actually in good condition. Then the piston and the handbrake caliper is here, and you have to twist that back in with a special kit so you can fit in the new brake pads, which are obviously wider than the worn brake pads, which is removed. And there you go. In goes the new handbrake caliper brake pads, which are really small, but again, these won't be under much heat because they're just for the handbrake. Now this isn't the usual way you'll change the handbrake caliper brake pads, but it's just a lot of the bolts were rusty and we didn't want to risk snapping them, especially as we wanted to get this on the road by the end of the video. Job done. Shall we see if the handbrake works? <laughs> Suspension is all lowered evenly. It's absolutely guesswork. I hope it's not too low that we can't get it off the ramp and we can't drive it, but it looks perfect. Chances of that, I don't know, I guess we'll find out. We've still got to leave the wheel off on that side because my dad's still going to do the handbrake pads on the other side. But the time has come for me to fix the gear stick. Here is 
the piece. You know how much that was? 50 quid. 80 quid. I'm uh, not too far. So that sits underneath the spring and it kind of goes in like that. Do you know I mean? Like it's got to go in there. So to get that out, we, I think we've got to knock that pin out, out of there, take that off, take the spring off, put this on and then put it all back together. Sounds easy. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, one pin. That little pin. That is the smallest pin in the world. Oh, sensational. Lovely then the spring, pin. then that. Now we've got to get his pin back in. And I haven't got my glasses. Oh, oh. Look at that. One step closer to get the driving Ferrari for my dad and he don't even know yet. Now I've just got to figure out how all of this gear shift mechanism went back together. First the gear stick goes in, which presses onto the cable at the bottom. Then I've got to knock in that thing at the back of the gear stick. Yes! And that's held in with a C-clip, which is really fiddly and I hate these type of jobs. After that, there's this thing, which I don't know what it's called, that slides in from the side, and then there's a spring, a washer, and all of that goes in the side as well. And once that's in, to hold it in place is a C-clip. Another really fiddly job. Liam had to push it all in place, and because it's spring-loaded, he had to hold it down whilst I was trying to get the C-clip in place. But eventually we got it in. After that, there's this threaded part which goes on the front of the gear stick, and after that, we put the gated part on to see if it all works, and hopefully it does. Here we go. It's pinged. Second. Third. Fourth. Fifth. <gasps> sixth. Okay, it won't go in reverse, but we might need to like jig the car around. Sometimes it does that, doesn't it? Successfully Pass to an extent. I'm going to bolt all this together, then we could adjust the cables to get the perfect gear shift. Mission success. Now the Ferrari is slowly getting there, but a lot of the components do look a little rusty and tired, especially underneath the wheel arches. But I think we have a solution for that. I called up the Ice Blasters. These guys can completely blast pretty much the whole car with dry ice, which doesn't make a mess, it doesn't get anything wet, and it does a really good job of cleaning and degreasing everything. And these guys are completely mobile. Just look at the difference it's made underneath the arches, and they even offered to do the carpets inside the car. I'm not entirely sure how this works, but it did a pretty good job. And I've left a link for you guys in the description below if you wanted to get any work done by these as well. So we can't get reverse. Um, we think it's a cable situation. So these cables here, which move all the mechanism, they can be adjusted. And when we take the gate off the gearbox, we can get it in reverse because it allows you just to go over a little bit further, which is actually pushing the cable that way. We just don't know which cable it is. So I think all we've got to do is I'll sit inside, push it all the way over, and then my dad will adjust it until I can actually put it into reverse. I think that's the, the way we're going to do it. Ready? Ready. Oh, I'm in reverse! Oh, fixed. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Tony. You got it first try. <laughs> is that good? Yeah, don't do anything. <laughs> because look, first, second, third, oh. fourth. Fifth, sixth, reverse. Come you... on then, let's get it on the road. Seats, door cards, wheels. Should we see how low it sits? Because then we can then we can push it off the ramp and we can open the doors up then and properly get access in here. Oh, I hope it's not too low. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> so you need to go up, put blocks of wood under it, it? then we can see how much, how low it is. Oh, no. 
Right, that is the ride height. And those wheels are tiny. Why did they do that on old supercars in the day? Yeah, boy. Look at the back. How did we guess that? Almost level. That's Next up, it's the engine covers. These fit either side of the engine, just to neaten up that engine bay a little bit more. There is a lot of other stuff which we can clean up in the engine bay, but we're going to be doing a lot of that stuff over on the Mark II channel. So make sure one, you guys are actually subscribed to this channel, and also the Mark II one if you want to see extra content. Once the engine covers are in, I moved back into the car and started reassembling the centre console once and for all, which uses a few Allen key bolts, and then the electrical connectors which connect to the hazard lights and the parking lights then I can push it all into its place only I seem to struggle a little bit when it comes to the ashtray so I've been trying to get it in like that but it probably goes like that <laughs> <laughs> some things just don't make sense on this Ferrari but I guess that's the beauty of Italian engineering and that's why we love these cars Finally, I can bolt in the gated shifter, the part which makes this Ferrari so rare, and that tops it off nicely. This was one of the first things that come out, and it's finally going back in. We're going with the OG seats because we've kept it kind of OG, really. What's OG yeah. Original gangster. <laughs> That's what you are, Tony and OG. <laughs> Everything is actually original. Like, we've lowered it a bit, which is a bit OG plus, but other than that, apart from the wheels. And the exhaust. Ah, ah. the exhaust is OG that, plus. That, yeah, that's OG plus. But that's a necessity, isn't it? I did actually buy some aftermarket bucket seats for the Ferrari, but then changed my mind and fitted the originals. And the reason being, we've pretty much kept everything original on this car. And if we have added anything aftermarket, it's always been subtle. That'll help with the value of the car. And also, if I do anything outrageous, my dad's probably not going to like it. But the original seats aren't even that bad. They're in pretty good condition for a nearly 20-year-old car. Just the final pieces now, before we can properly test drive this car. I've just got to finish assembling the door card on the left hand side, and then we can move over to the driver's side, which we were both really struggling on trying to sort this window regulator out. So we've managed to rebuild an engine, rebuild a gearbox, and the one thing that's defeated us is this window regulator. It won't lift the window up straight. <laughs> <laughs> that's how it that's how it closes that's what we're gonna have to deal with <laughs> Unfortunately, we didn't have the time to fix this for now because we had to go to Wheelmania to pick up the new wheels. And there's a lot of other things on the Ferrari that we do need to get sorted to make it absolutely perfect. But for now, we just needed to get it on the road for the first time. The car's come a hell of a long way since we picked it up and a lot of people probably never thought it would go back on the road. And to be honest, neither did I. My dad's about to get one hell of a car. That's if it all works and goes to plan. But even though there's still more bits to touch up, it looks absolutely unreal. It's crazy to think this is a 2005 car. Okay, my dad's driving it. First actual proper drive. The door card's rattling, that is well annoying. The steering is miles out. Oh my god! What the hell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it sounds good. Yeah, I think it's going good. It's, yeah. quite, it's quite scary when you've just rebuilt everything. <laughs> so they have that much faith in the Ferrari. Me and Liam are in the pickup truck following. So if it breaks down, we've got a get out of jail free card. Yeah. <laughs> This is a proper get out of jail free card. But we didn't need the get out of jail free card because the Ferrari was driving great and looking great. Even if the steering wheel was turning right when we're going in a straight line. And it wasn't long until we arrived at Wheelmania. 
We're here, we've finally made it to Wheelmania. It's done its first drive. My dad's drove it for the first time. I've drove it for the first time. It's made it here. There's a few little issues here and there, but the main thing, the engine works and the gearbox works. And here we are at Wheelmania. Of course, the wheels. Because these ones just are, well, one side's grey, back in my bag, one side's girl. silver, and they're 18 inch. I think they're a bit Conscious. too small. Let's go, let's go get, let's go get the wheels. Back in my bag, and I gotta brag, I do this shit for real. When we was down, and we had nothing, we had to share a meal. We oh put the shit yeah. Drive with no steering wheel. Shorty throw that thing back in a pair of hell. That looks nuts. Twenty all round, and then we've gone for a nine by twenty on the front, and not too aggressive on the rear. We've gone for eleven by twenty on the rear. Yeah, so it's kind of like an OEM look. Like it still looks like the original wheel, doesn't it? Yeah, but it's just better it's in every way. It's just better, wider, bigger, better tyres on as well. It's keeping it OG, OG. plus. OG plus. That's, That's what we're going. Yeah. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> that is sick. MA branding and you could get it all at Wheelmania. Could someone do that themselves as well? Yes, so they'll know their initials, they could order forged and put their own initials on. How about that? And with the link in the description, there's a 100% discount code there. Whoa, 100%! <laughs> MA100! <laughs> no, there is a WhatsApp number there, and if you guys message Jordan, he'll sort you out if you've come from me. Go get him on the car now. Yeah, don't, he ain't gonna let me drive it after he's got them on. Oh yeah, because he'll be curving <laughs> yeah. This is it. We all know it's the wheels which completely top off the build. And I think by going with these OEM Plus Star wheels, it's gonna finish off the Ferrari perfectly. But is my dad gonna like it? We've put a lot of work into this car and Wheelmania are about to finish it off with these custom wheels. Let's see how she looks with her new shoes. Yeah. Look at the fitment, it's like we almost knew, didn't we? And there it is. An almost finished Ferrari F430. But, one last thing. My dad has now got to fix all the broken parts on the car because this is yours. What? <laughs> it's your, this is your Ferrari. <laughs> no, it ain't. Yeah, it is, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yours. <laughs> but, but we're not fixing it anymore, is it? <laughs> this is all on you now, mate. <laughs> yeah, it's mine. Yeah. It's yours, but dad. <laughs> you got a Ferrari, mate. Yeah, I can't believe it. My dad has helped me build my dream car, the Murcielago. He's helping me build the McLaren. He helped me build the purple GT3 out in Florida. And little did he know, he was helping build his own Ferrari. The least I could do was let him have the Ferrari. Go on then. Wow. Who's <laughs> coming over me? <laughs> now he's got a Rolex and a Ferrari. <laughs> You're right out of this channel. <laughs> That's the outro. Thanks so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button, hit the thumbs up button, and I'll see you in the next video. Peace out. I've been watching Mr. Tumble. <laughs> Mr. Tumble? And do you know what he does? What does he do? Sign language. Go on, do some sign language. What does that mean? Hello! <laughs> like a drug there, I just can't deny.